Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's City Council meeting, May 7th, 2018. First off, uh, the city is having some uh, technical difficulties with the projection system and our computers up here. So folks are not going to be able to see anything on the screen. And folks that are at home watching um, on Channel 8 or via the web, you can be able to pull up the informational packets, the presentations on the web, but uh, you will not be able to see them on the screen tonight because something's not working right. So please bear with us. Will the clerk, clerk please call the roll? Mayor Ford? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Teeter? Here. Councilmember Madera? Here. Councilmember Frank? Present. Councilmember Diaz? Here. Councilmember Douglas? Present. Councilmember Huseman? Present. Councilmember Elliott? Present. Councilmember Hordiola? Present. Mr. Mayor, you have a quorum. Thank you. For the record, uh, we are all here this evening. Now, if everybody one will please stand and join me in a moment of silence, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now, if the staff will please pass around the microphone and allow everybody the opportunity to introduce themselves. Oh, I was just kind of signed up to speak. Thank you. Uh, Nicole Baker, I live at 3796 East 64th Avenue. I'm Ron Baker, I live at 3796 East 64th Commerce City. Mike Brown, Parks and Recreation. Carolyn Keith, Parks and Recreation. My name is Susan Noble. I'm Carly Seller. Teresa Eskridge. Eric Goodmanson. Lisa Goodmanson. Aaron Carpenter, Bell Creek. Scott Prasca, Bell Creek. Cameron Greer, Bell Creek. Martin Stites. Susan Carvajal, representing Kit Kat. Tamara Graf. Hazel Grace. Dora Sylvie. Stephanie Sylvie. Perry Sylvie. Maria DeAndre, Public Works. Kathy Blakeman, Human Resources. Shannon Wester from Bell Creek. Lori Tatlock from Bell Creek. Wes Atkins. All right, thank you all for being here tonight. We started in our agenda. We start off with proclamation. Uh, we have a proclamation tonight for uh, kids to Parks Day. I'd like to invite Carolyn Keith, Parks and Rec and Golf Director, forward. Good evening. Why don't you tell us about Kids to Parks Day? Honorable Mayor, members of City Council, Kids to Parks Day is a national initiative, and we've asked Council to recognize the Kids in Parks Day. You will see numerous activities happening throughout the Denver metro area this coming weekend, or excuse me, next weekend. Uh, our event will be Friday, May 18th. It's actually one of our youth events uh, in the park with the Commerce City Police Department. And then there will be numerous activities happening throughout the metro area on Saturday the 19th. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Will the uh, city attorney please read the proclamation? Whereas May 19th, 2018 is the 8th Kids to Parks Day organized and launched by the National Park Trust held annually on the third Saturday of May. And whereas Kids to Parks Day empowers kids and encourages families to get outdoors and visit America's parks, 
and whereas we should encourage children to lead a more active lifestyle to combat the issues of childhood obesity, diabetes mellitus, hypertension, and hypercholesterolemia, and whereas Commerce City is home to the nation's largest urban wildlife refuge, which boasts more than 330 animal species, hiking and walking trails, self-guided tours, and breathtaking views of the Front Range, and whereas Commerce City has more than 700 acres of open and park space residents can enjoy, and whereas Kids to Parks Day is open to all children and adults across the country to encourage a large and diverse group of participants, now therefore be it resolved that the City Council of Commerce City proclaims May 19, 2018 as Kids to Parks Day and urge residents to take time and take the children in their lives to a neighborhood state or national park. Thank you. And just for the uh, council, because we're getting ready to uh, have to get my attention, the lights are not working, so you're going to have to raise your hand, let me know that you want to speak or get my attention. So the proclamation's been read. I'm open for a motion. Mr. Teeter? I'd like to approve the proclamation for Kids to, to Parks Day. Thank you. Is there a second? <clears throat> Mr. <clears throat> Madera? Second. I have a motion to second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, say no. <clears throat> Motion is carried. Um, thank you very much. We'll come down, take a picture real quick, if everybody will join me down front. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you to the, the kids in the audience. It was awesome, and our uh, youth that's, that's here. So next item on the agenda is our citizen communication portion of the meeting. Per council policy, citizen communication is the time on our agenda for the public to address council on businesses and affairs of the city. The City Council is not able to hear any comments on land use matters that are before or may come before Council. Please reserve those comments for the appropriate public hearing. Please give your name and address for the record and keep your comments limited to three minutes. Thank you. So I'll start calling names on the list. Just come up, state your name and address, and uh, let us know what you're here for. Wes Adkins. Good evening. Wes, Wes Atkins, 7620 East 81st Avenue. And I'm here in regards uh, a year ago in July of last year, I brought before the city council how the code officers uh, passed judgment upon me, judge, jury, and convicted me without due process of law and seized my property. And I'm still in question of you found anything out as to how they can do this without taking me to jury or trial without issuing citation. Mr. Attorney? Pardon? I'm asking the attorney. Uh, Mayor Ford, after Mr. Adkins uh, was here last July, I did reach out to the attorney he'd contacted at the time, um, but did not hear a response from him. 
Um, the city does have a process for code enforcement that's uh, set forth in the municipal code for the service of a citation and an opportunity for protest um, to an administrative hearing officer. Okay, oh, and, and for, to, to the best of your knowledge, that to the best of my knowledge, that as process I recall, was followed properly. Yes, I did uh, provide a, a confidential update to council uh, back in July of last year. Okay. All right. So, according to our attorney, what uh, the attorney is saying, Wes, is that through the uh, process that was that was handled, that it was done properly. Um, we don't get involved with the court side of things. So once uh, a ticket is issued, I, I was never issued a ticket. Okay, were you, for for non-compliance on your property, nothing. I was never given no ticket for anything. Okay, all right, Mr. Attorney, you want to look into this and give the council an update, and make sure that everything that was done was done legally. Yes, Mayor Ford, I will. Thank I will you. look back into it and, and contact the code enforcement. Would you please get? Uh, Mr. Atkins' number so he could be contacted and, and uh, know the findings as well? Yes, sir. Thank you. Wes, if you will uh, give the attorney your number so we can contact you, we'll look into it and find out, make sure that everything was handled properly. I'm sorry, I can't hear what you said. said, would you please give your contact information to the city attorney so that he can reach out to you when he reaches out to the council after he looks into it and assures us that everything was done properly. And if there was a problem, then he will let you know that it wasn't handled properly. But the okay. attorney's going to look into it from a legal standing. Okay. Okay? All right. I'll have my attorney look into it, too. That's fine. And you can, you can have him contact the city attorney, yeah. Mr. Sheasley. Thank you for coming in tonight. All right, next will be Scott Pravlika. Hopefully that's right. I didn't screw it up too bad. Uh, Scott Praska, oh, 9481 okay. East 109th Drive, up in Bell Creek. Okay. Uh, so thanks for letting me talk to you, and thank you especially to Ms. Frank for taking my call a couple of weeks ago. Um, I'm sure you're aware of this letter that we received up there about our street becoming a no parking zone. And I've got several of my neighbors here with me tonight. Um, and we were given to understand that this has been placed on hold, right? That's funny because today the signs went up and our street is now a no parking zone. So when we drive home tonight, we've got to go find parking someplace. Um, this, uh, I understand, was done with no community involvement whatsoever. Um, I believe the Metro District was not, was not consulted either. And um, uh, just wanted to just make you aware of several consequences of this. Uh, I've been living there for 13 years since uh, that street opened. Never had a, an incident with parking. In the letter here, it says that uh, one of the reasons for this is people driving the wrong way. It doesn't explain why parking influences the direction people drive. But, um, and then it also says there's an issue with emergency vehicles. But we haven't had a, a problem in 13 years. Um, when we moved in, uh, we all knew we had parking. This affects 15 units. We had 10 townhomes on one side, five single-family homes on the other. And uh, the single-family homes all have one-car garages. Everybody I know has at least two earners in the family who have to drive to their jobs, so we all have at least two cars. Some of us have kids in college, also have cars for their jobs and going to school. And if you make our street a no-parking zone, it leaves us no place to park. Um, for one thing, I believe there's a city ordinance that says we cannot park in front of somebody else's house for more than five hours. So now that these signs are up, you've got 15 units full of people who are going to be driving into the neighbor's streets, and then you're going to have to start uh, enforcing that five-hour ordinance because they're going to complain. Then we're going to have to find another place to park, which I guess will be blocks away in front of parks on the edge of the neighborhood where there are no homes and the five-hour ordinance does not apply. Of course, that makes the cars very vulnerable. We can't see them. We can't hear them. Any opportunist who wants to break in, and, and we've had break-ins, will know those are the most vulnerable cars. Additionally, you've, you've got the obvious problems with bringing the groceries in, carrying them for blocks, any other stuff you need to transport. You've got any elderly people or uh, injured people or disabled people will have an extra hardship. 
uh, if they're guests or if they live there. You've got people walking through the snow and the ice in the winter. You've got rain in the spring. You've got lightning strikes, perhaps. Um, you've also got people like my daughter, who no longer lives with us, but did for a long time when she was in college, is a nurse, comes home at various hours of the night and is very uncomfortable walking in the, in the dark, puts her out there. And for those of us who can't live with this and now need to consider moving, there goes our property value because now we have to find buyers who don't care about driving to their own homes. So I, I think it's, it's just not right. And I'm, I'm sure I, I've, I'm heartened here because I see that you guys sit through four-hour meetings a couple times a week, which means you must really care about your residents. And I'm sure you don't want to make us this miserable by just saying, sorry, you know, the street is not there for you. It's there for other people who want to drive through. You guys are in the way. Get your cars out of there and just change your lives to live without your cars. Well, I, I think there are some answers. And I didn't know the signs went up today. I think it's important for the Bell Creek community to know that the city council didn't meet and say, go put up parking signs, all right? So when we heard about it, the city manager put a stop to those signs going up. I don't know why they went up today. I'll tell you what happened. There was a gentleman or a person, a, a resident that had a medical emergency. The fire department and the police department both came into the city and said, there's a problem. We had a time issue to be able to get into there because of the, of the parked cars. So that initiated that to happen, not through the city council, but through the protocol of the police department, the fire department. So apparently there's a median that may be too wide. Last thing I think anybody on the city council or staff wants to do is take away your parking. But I think we have to find a way to mitigate the situation so that emergency vehicles can get through there and so that the residents have parking. I mean, we want the best case scenario to take place. I would refer to the city manager and ask him uh, about the signs going up today um, because the last I knew there was a pause put on those signs going in. According to Public Works Director DeAndre, the signs were not installed, so we're not sure what signs were installed today. Suffice it to there say, it if yeah. any signs were installed, there will be no enforcement of those restrictions until we sort out what are the alternatives for solving the emergency access problem. Without a doubt, the street's too narrow to permit on-street parking, uh, although it's had on-street parking for a number of years. But there are other possible solutions besides parking restrictions on the street. So we're looking at some alternatives. Uh, my intent is to reach out to the Metro District once we have some options to have a conversation about a better long-term solution. Okay. So if there are no parking signs that were recently placed along that corridor, as you heard the city manager, they will not be enforced. So um, you can still park there. And we're looking for alternate ways to fix the problem without taking away parking and to be able to get emergency equipment through that area. And, and as you mentioned, that you've lived there a lot, a lot of years and you haven't, haven't had this problem. We also know there were some new units put in. There's more, more people parking there now because there's some new, new homes in the area. So um, because of that and the uh, one emergency that happened where there was an issue with getting emergency equipment in there, we're trying to manage it the best way we can. So the city manager will reach out to the Metro District. We'll figure out alternatives and what we can do. But our goal is to make sure you keep your parking and we can still make sure that emergency equipment can get into the area. All right? Much appreciated. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for coming in tonight. Lori. Tatlock? Yes. Come on up. I'm Lori Tatlock. I manage the Bell Creek Metro okay. District. And you have I'm, an address for me, I please. I do, 1168 South Gilpin Street in Denver. Okay. Um, I do have handouts. If, did you want any of the maps or letters? You, yeah, hand them to the city attorney there, and he'll okay. get them to us. Okay, perfect. Um, so the first page is, is basically the email that I sent you last week, mm -hmm. um, all of you. The issue of the parking and then the issue of the realignment of Bell Creek Boulevard are two instances when I think Commerce City has made some decisions and not involved the Metro District. 
and it, it's um, been to the detriment of the residents and their property values. Um, on the, I'm, I'm happy to work with them on the parking. That's kind of the last page of, of my handout. And um, yes, there were uh, 22 new townhomes constructed in that general area. It was always planned for, but something didn't go right as far as the planning. And there's a large median that we can work with. And I know people have been paying property taxes in Bell Creek for almost 20 years, so I, I think there should be some money available to them to, to get this problem solved. I noticed that, um, I just did a brief analysis, um, Bell Creek in a year ago had 11700000 in assessed value. Um, with the new valuations, we went up to 14700000 The mill levy going to um, Commerce City went from 3.128 to 3.16, so just this year, there's been an, an extra $9,800 just from the Bell Creek residents to Commerce City. So um, then the other issue is um, the realignment of Bell Creek Boulevard. Um, the district was never notified that this was happening, and I understand the reasons for it. But um, we had a, a nicely landscaped and thoughtful entry into the Bell Creek community. And now it's getting jammed up against the Hazeltine water tank. And the water tank has a dilapidated fence. Our landscaping has been removed. And they say that they're going to save it and put it back in, but there's no plan for it. Um, and the, the water tank has a barbed wire and dilapidated fence that kind of looks junky. And we, I'm here with the Bell Creek residents, and they're proud of their community, and I think they feel like they kind of got the short straw on this one. So anyway, well, I'd like me, to work with you. Let me you try on. to address some of those questions. Of course, the parking, you know how that's going. Yep. City manager is going to reach out <clears throat> to the Metro District. When it comes to the Bell Creek access entrance off of 104th Avenue, yes. Uh, from my understanding, the city's been talking to the Metro District as long as four years ago about the fact that the access that's in right now doesn't meet the conformity for the highway and needs to be moved to the west. We also have an obligation to allow access to the property to the south, which will be a commercial development and, and in result should have opportunities for shopping and restaurants and other things um, that I don't think will hurt your property values. As a matter of fact, should increase your property values. When it comes to landscaping, um, everything that we have done, we have tried to make it the very best. And so I can't see that the, act, the entryway to Bell Creek is not going to look good when it's done. Well, I haven't, I've managed the district since 2008, and the firm that I work for has been involved in the district since its inception in 2000. And I was never notified, formally or informally, until I went and talked to Mr. Hammer about the, that. Uh, in the plans, there's no landscaping plan. And also, in the right-of-way that's being, I guess, abandoned, all the utilities are going to remain, so there's no really development value to it because it's going to be filled with water and sewer and storm. Yeah, so. it'll, it'll have easements. Um, I want to, uh, again, let the city manager address the um, issue of the entryway. I think as, um, as the mayor indicated, the intersection and its current configuration is too close to Highway 85 in order to provide access to the property to the south. It had to shift about 150, 200 feet west. Certainly, uh, the plans that have been designed are intended to make an attractive intersection. Uh, there's development existing on the north side. We expect to see quality development on the south side. Quality infrastructure will be necessary for that to happen. Uh, the responsibility of installing the intersection is not the city's. It is the developer on the south side. Uh, the city is helping to pay uh, for the intersection relocation as part of a settlement agreement that we have with Mr. Hammer. Uh, I know there have been discussions with property owners on the north side going back several years about the need to relocate the intersection. <clears throat> but I, I can assure you we're going to make it look nice. Okay. We'll make Mr. Hammer make it look nice. We want it to be as nice as it was before they, they move it. Okay. okay. Well, uh, that's what my intent is. Okay. Well, so. and, and, you know, in any 
planning jurisdiction, when you submit plans, you have to right. submit landscape plans. Well, and I, I, I have agree. the plans. There are no landscape plans well, in, the, in this and, area. And Mr. Hammer is responsible for developing that entryway. Okay. And so we will make sure we stay on top of it and that it looks right. Okay. If well, it, if it doesn't meet your expectations, we'll expect to see you back. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. Carly Seller. Right. Um, I'm Carly Seller. I live in uh, Buffalo Mesa, and I'm here tonight to talk about my concerns with the gas and oil uh, extraction, gas and oil, their new proposal. Um, I know I've spoken to the city council many times uh, over the last 12 years that I've lived here, and um, I really wanted to really introduce myself tonight. So in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to turn 60. I uh, have lived in Commerce City since April of 2006. This is the longest I've ever lived anywhere in my entire adult life. I really enjoy my community. Um, I have loved the, my house. I chose the area because it was in close proximity to where I work, which is the airport, and um, the housing options when I came here in 2006. It was really quite amazing to see all the things I could choose from. In my neighborhood, um, houses, and that's the Buffalo Mesa reunion area, houses go for as little as 375000 and uh, up to a million dollars over by the golf course. I've uh, watched the community grow from 19,000 people to about 60,000. When I moved out there, we didn't have very good roads. We had, I didn't even have street lights. Today, we've got grocery stores, we've got schools, the roads have improved vastly over the years. Um, I am looking forward to using this new uh, community center that's going to be opening. Uh, the average house in my neighborhood takes about 12 days to sell. Um, this is the map that we got off of the uh, Cal uh, Colorado Gas and Conservation Commission website. And these green lines represent all of the line, not Belt Creek, but all of the lines that are being proposed with the extraction gas and oil uh, application that is currently underway. And what I understand is that at 120th and um, Tower Road, they will have their pad. It will be between five and 10 acres. And uh, at the pad, they will drill down one and a half uh, miles. And each one of these can be up to 16. There's going to be 16 of these. Each one will be up to two miles. So as you can see, they have about 56 miles of concrete. And one of the things I know at the airport is that 13% um, of all commercially poured concrete fails. So. Somewhere in this, two and a half miles of concrete is going to fail. This is like right under everyone's house. My house is basically right here, not quite where the X is, but pretty close. But I'm just here out of concern that this application will go forward. Um, there are so many reasons for us to be concerned about this, besides all of the health uh, reasons and the exposure to the chemicals. Uh, the state of Colorado last year in 2017, we had 619 incidents that resulted in 93,000 gallons of oil that was reported spilled either in the soil, groundwater, or in streams, and we had another 506 gallons of toxic liquid waste from the fracking operations that was spilled into our streams, our soil, and the fumes into the air. Um, I'm, I have a lot of concerns about our agreements with extraction, just to be honest with you. Um, according to uh, Moody's, extraction has a total debt of $1.5 billion. Most of it's in unsecured notes. Moody's classified extraction last, or last year's bonds, $750 million are due 
and um, it's they're due in 2026, and they've classified those bonds as junk, not investment quality. Extraction paid their CEO, Mark Erickson, $33 million, or he, they paid him over the last two years $33 million. Their president, Matthew Owen, has received about $28 million during that time. So I have a lot of concerns about how solvent extraction really is. And as they're drilling under all these houses out here, what if something happens? I mean, the moment they start drilling, our homeowner's insurance is negated. It's no longer of any value to us. Um, we couldn't possibly file a, a claim against them. So, you know, how solvent is extraction to come back and help us when there's damages of any kind? Um, how are we going to be checking that they aren't spilling into our soil and our water? And most of the water from Commerce City is all groundwater. So I'm very concerned that when we do have problems, we'll be the last ones to know or there won't be a way to correct it in a timely fashion. Um, one of the other things I wanted to say, too, is that we all know Adams County and Jefferson County are two of the fastest growing counties. We're also the heavy, heaviest populated counties in Colorado. And um, I heard a presentation recently, but I wasn't able to fact check that. Uh, but uh, Coloradans live and work on 2% of our land mass. And if that's the case, I just don't understand why they have to drill right under our houses, that there aren't other places where they could possibly go um, to extract this gas and oil. I, I just don't understand that this is really the only place that gas and oil exists. I, I, I don't even buy into that. So my questions for the council are, I understand you've hired a new attorney. Is the attorney working for the benefit of the city and all of us that live in this city? Uh, can we contact the attorney to ask questions? Will you be setting up measures so that if we do start having foundation problems or problems in our home that we've never had before, that we have some recourse with extraction? All right, well, I want to get to some of those questions. Mm -hmm. I need to uh, refer to the city attorney, Mr. Sheasley, um, to identify if we have applications, um, wh where they're at in the process, what's going on, and what our legal jurisdiction allows from us. Thank you, Mayor Ford. Uh, to my knowledge, the city has not yet received applications for city oil and gas subsurface extraction permits, which are governed by our land development code. There are a number of applications to the state commission, which is a regulatory body at the state level, for um, regulating the, the whole gamut of oil and gas activity for the most part. That is the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. Um, there are a number of applications pending with that body and that's available um, through our city website. There's a link to the pending applications that the city receives as an interested party as a local government referral. Um, with regard to the separation of jurisdiction and the regulatory authority of the city and the, the state commission, there are a number of um, Supreme Court decisions from the state Supreme Court in the last few years delineating the areas in which local governments are able to regulate through their land use jurisdiction um, the oil and gas activities and restricting those as broad speaking primarily to things on the surface. Um, anything that the state regulates um, that preempts local regulation would control. As to hiring an attorney, the city attorney is the city's attorney for the city organization. We are consulting with an outside counsel, special counsel, um, who has expertise in these matters, who is available for city reference, uh, meaning the organization. Um, but in not order for to us. Get... Is that correct? So it's for the... Uh, it's for the city. Apologize, I need That's to direct okay. to, the, to the council. So. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that attorney is available for our consultation where extra help is needed. Um, there is going to be additional, if I can mention that, 
There will be regular updates coming. The city manager and I have coordinated to have regular updates to council in public on pending applications at the second meeting, second regular council meeting of every month. And so the next, the first one of that will be on the 21st of May and to give an update on whether the city has received applications and the state applications just to give an update as to where things are occurring in the city. Um, there's also an executive session planned for that night to discuss some legal strategy um, relative to recent court decisions and other matters that are ongoing that um, we'll need to provide to develop uh, a strategy with the city council. So I hope, does that answer your question generally, sir? Generally, yes. Is there anyone on council has any comments? Mr. Douglas. Uh, yes. Um, thank you. Um, thanks for bringing this forward. Um, since all this talk's going on with the extraction, uh, is there any way that we can have a meeting with the extraction? Because all these things go on behind the scenes outside of our, our jurisdiction as far as where these things are located. I believe those are in the county. And it makes it kind of hard for us because it's not happening in the city. But the drilling will be happening underneath our, our, our properties in the city even though the allocation is going to be outside. And so that's more of a county thing than of a city thing. So, uh, so uh, Mr. Douglas, the actual drilling locations are identified, I believe, on the Form 2A applications filed at the state level. So to the extent there are actual well pad sites, those are identified at the state's uh, website in those applications. And that would identify whether they're going to be in the city or in the county. Um, but to the extent that they're outside of the city, the um, the company doesn't necessarily have to meet with the city to engage in any sort of process. If it involves a city permit, um, the land development code assigns responsibility for reviewing those to staff. And so council's role in that is very um, limited to setting the high policy through the land development code provisions. Well, I'm advising that there's only, I mean, this is just me, that we had that discussion with, with extraction. I mean. I've seen it in other cities in the county. Uh, if you're going to do, you know, as far as these drillers coming in and they want to extract, to have that public meeting, uh, you know, the public needs to be heard. And I hate for them to come in this, um, our civic center, and bring this up without having a voice in, a, in, in discussion. Because there's certain things we can and can't do, but those things need to be clear. And... No one, to be, no one likes to be ambushed. And I think if we prepare ourselves and put it out there so the public knows what's going on, the public gets an opportunity to ask those questions to extraction. This is a public arena. I mean, none of us hold, hold you know, as, as far as the city um, with any kind of agreement. We know that. Um, but these are outside things that are our threat uh, that I feel that the citizens need to be heard and not in this arena. We're not the ones who are putting this forward. This is coming from uh, extraction. May I recommend, Mr. Douglas, and for any members out there, the, um, the link through the city's website, if you search for oil and gas on the website, will link to the Oil and Gas Conservation Commission's website, which will identify hearing dates and public comment dates. So the eight entity with the most ability to identify and approve well sites, um, outside of the city especially, Mm -hmm. um, is that commission, and that, that is an opportunity for a public forum. To the extent there is a city process, there is an opportunity for public comment on that as well um, to engage uh, on an application once it's submitted. So, so those four are, are out there, just so, so well, you're aware. I know in 2012, um, well, 2011, actually, before, I mean, there's five of us here that were sworn in then, before we even be able to have a full week of being on council, we were, in, we were inundated by a by that industry outside of our city because it wasn't the enclave in the county. At that time, Anadarko came to the city and we had a big, huge discussion. We had uh, citizens, uh, citizens um, I'd say, coalition uh, and with um, Anadarko. And we sat here in the council chamber and we discussed uh, future uh, drilling regulations and everything, and that led up to what our regulations are today. So it's not that we can't do something like that. It's something that we should ask them to, to so instead of them being in the shadows, come up front and have that discussion with the citizens because ultimately 
It's going to come back to us, and, and it's going to be out of our hands. And that way, at least they know what, what's, what's going on right now with their citizens. Because what they're asking, it, I don't think is bad. Um, I just hate for us not to be uh, in a position where our hands are tied. And just because this is not the city, this is extraction, and this is their business deal. But the citizens are very concerned. So I think it's just an ask that we entertain uh, some sort of arrangement where the citizens can talk to extraction and tell them what their concerns are. Not the city, but we make that arrangement. Brian? Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, we got notice today that our hearing is June 12th, but it's in Greeley. So we have to drive all the way to Greeley. I also understand that even if we make comments, that's all they are, is just comments that we really don't have a voice or a way in. Uh, about 230 of us own our mineral rights. Uh, that's out of probably about, I don't know, 3,000 houses, households there. Um, but it's been very confusing to try and figure out what those rights mean or don't mean, what the best avenue is. Um, the process, I agree with you, it's not at all transparent because the people that don't own the mineral rights have received nothing, no notification, absolutely nothing. And they'll be impacted by this the same way people with the mineral rights will be impacted, but they're not even notified. They don't even know uh, unless they've been on a Facebook page or uh, been in touch with somebody on that Nextdoor app. So it hasn't been transparent at all. But Brian, you had something you wanted to add? I was just going to um, emphasize a point that Mr. Sheasley made. There is an executive session planned in two weeks at the May 21st meeting. Uh, one of the keys of that executive session is to update council on the changing legal landscape. City council's key role in managing oil and gas in this community is to adopt our land use regulations. And city council, as part of an extensive process in 2012, did adopt pretty significant changes to our land use regulations in the land development code. Uh, so it's possible after that executive session in two weeks, city council may wish to revisit our regulations. Uh, but again, until an application has been filed, there's no regulatory role for the city uh, with extraction, oil and gas. Should they submit an application, they would be required to follow uh, the city's rules in our land development code. That process does not provide for a public hearing. It does provide for public comment. And those applications, again, don't appear before the city council. But the city's land use regulations are uh, the clear jurisdiction of the city council. Thank you. And for, for the benefit of the council, on top of that, at the COGCC level, the city staff uh, with the city attorney's office and the assistance of outside council is actively reviewing any application uh, for activity within the city or that, that were referred uh, to review the impact on the city and to address concerns that we anticipate that council and the public would have, particularly insofar as the location of the wells and the impacts um, on the public and on public infrastructures. Um, that, that is being taken into account. Thank you. Thank you for coming in this evening. Oh, let me see, Mr. Madera. So I'm on the website right now, and you know if you do go onto the oil and gas page, there's links to all the proposed paths that are with the COGCC, as, long, as well as the deadlines for those common periods. And some of them are as early as next Monday. So I strongly suggest to go on there, leave your comment with the COGCC. There's also links to the maps, and you know, we're trying to be as transparent as possible. And, you know, our staff is doing a great job of putting all the information that's going directly with the state so our citizens can be involved and, you know, you can have your voice heard from the, the state as well. Thank you. We, we've been doing that on a routine basis yeah. and making comments. Mr. Hughesman. Thank you. Um, as far as the pad sites that are currently proposed, are they in our predefined growth boundaries? I don't know. I would have to check. 
the ones that I'm aware of are north of the city. I don't know if there are any in our growth boundary. That's certainly possible. There, there are some pad sites that are within city boundaries, however, as well. All right. So I, I think to caveat on Councilman Douglas's point, I think it would behoove us to be able to have a meeting with them because although that is not city property now, in the future that very well could be within our boundaries and could have an impact as our future plans going forward. Thank you. Anyone else? Let's make a last comment. Mr. Douglas. Um, I just want to say that, you know, we go an executive, to an executive, a executive session and per executive session we cannot discuss what we have discussed in executive session that's that's council policy so and I'm not trying to not say we're not, not to have one but it's just being transparent is to have extraction come before the citizens in a, in, in a safe environment so they can discuss what their future plans are because once those things are out there after we have executive sessions, we are limited to what we can comment on, if anything, to, to, to uh, for or against. Um, Mr. Douglas, the executive session is not intended to discuss extraction-specific proposals, but more the city's uh, strategy in responding to that. There will be a public component of that, though, to provide as much transparency as possible into what the city's understanding of the activity is and the, the response would be. Um, the staff is actively engaged with the extraction um, to discuss the issues that council's addressed in the past, um, but we certainly could ask about the willingness to engage in that sort of public meeting um, and, and see what their response would be. Okay, I appreciate it because back in 2011 when we had this, this, this discussion with Anadarko, and it was several months, it wasn't just a one-time thing. We, we had this council, we had a, a round table discussion um, we, of course, we had to separate uh, the, the uh, two different groups because uh, things got kind of out of hand. But then we did a resolution, and, and out, that outcome was what our regulation is today. And I just want to prepare us for this because just because that happened then does not mean it's going to be successful this time. And this is a future thing. This is not going away. And 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 as you know, we have plenty of land out here, and I just don't like the way that that industry has come in with residential because it does it does hurt our growth boundary. It's good a point where it's like oil well, and water, they just don't mix. And so when something like that comes in, it's gonna stagnate our growth. And that may hurt us economically. So I'm looking at the long term, not the short term. And dealing with the extraction, you know, they have third parties and all that, but they are here and they're trying to make a make a stake, not only in Commerce City but Adams County. And and um you know, our potential grows with 125,000. We may not get there. And with that there, we may have, it, that might hurt people's property values. But I tell you what, though, I know in Greeley, this crash and had a discussion with the citizens, and they actually moved that well site that they were going to drill to another area because of the uh, public outcry. So, and, and that's just it, we're, for us to be transparent and, and give our citizens an outlet where they can feel freely to discuss their issues without being threat. Thanks. Any other council comments? Mr. Huseman? Um, I just wanted to follow up. You know, the um, lobbyist for extraction has reached out to all of his council members and wanted to sit down and talk with us individually. So I think if they're really concerned with talking with us, then they should be willing to talk to the community as a whole as opposed to just the nine elected members sitting up here. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Saying none, thank you, ladies, for coming in this evening. All right, next, uh, Susan Noble. Just state your name and address for the record, Hi, please. thank you. Um, good evening, city council members, mayor, and staff. Um, my name is Susan Noble, and I've been a resident of Commerce City over the past five years. And I want to give us some background first and then make um, some requests. My husband and I live in the reunion area. I don't want to be redundant with what Carly Seller just said, but there are some things that I want to add. Our daughter is buying a house here in Reunion that will close in September, and my husband was an executive with Exxon for a decade. 
Last month, we were stunned to learn the reunion was targeted for fracking and horizontal drilling. We only became aware because neighboring Buffalo Mesa residents began receiving spacing letters from extraction oil and gas and wondered online what the letters were. Then Turnberry residents asked Bell Creek and Stillwater, all of whom had received these same letters. Then Buffalo Run and Potomac Farms. The visuals that we obtained from the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission laid out the letters meeting in vibrant detail. But I do want to point out something on the map. Could you guys? So here's Turnberry and Potomac Farms. They don't show anything on the COGCC map, but they do have letters from extraction oil and gas. Um, Buffalo Run only got their letter two weeks ago and it was not yet on the city's website, and I stopped in actually at the city to point that out to them, that how, if they don't know, then how do we know? The turquoise lines, of course, are the individual well cores emanating from a drilling pad. I think someone was asking about that. These blue squares are the drilling pads within the city boundaries of the city of Commerce City. Um, each line means the earth will be fracked down to sea level, releasing oil and chemicals, including radon. 11 million gallons of water from South Adams County Water District is required to drill each well, just as we're facing water shortages. Nearly 10 square miles of Northern Commerce City will be directly impacted, as you can see from all those well, well core lines. Thousands of homes, many schools and churches, parks, and even the Buffalo Run golf course. Fracked water loaded with chemicals will be reinjected into an unused well, a well well into its lifespan before 100% failure is assured at the 40-year mark. We don't know where they're going to put their water, but they don't leave it in a pond. They had to put it somewhere, and they put it down an old well. Methane gas and chemicals will leak or spread from the flame at the drilling pad. The odor alone, not to mention the health consequences on children and the elderly, is well documented in many cities, including the city of Erie. The vibration, as this is constructed, will be felt for months and months, accidental explosions and spills. If an industrial company came to the building department with plans for a plant in a residential area, we hope that the answer would be no, that's incompatible with our zoning laws. If you as council members knew then what you know now, would you have approved the Suncor refinery in Southern Commerce City? We hope your answer would be no. Because of the breadth of this challenge in the vast area to which extraction oil and gas is staking its claim, we are forming North Range Concerned Citizens. Tonight we ask, if a resident does not own the underlying mineral rights, then there is no way of knowing that an oil and gas company plans to drill. Only residents with mineral rights are notified. We request that the city council shine a light, and I think Councilmember Douglas was talking about this, and require oil and gas companies to notify the City of Commerce City for projects within its borders when it first applies to the Colorado Commission or COGCC, and B, direct staff to publish maps of proposed drilling pads and boundaries in the Commerce City newsletter. No citizens should be in the dark over something this consequential. Second, the Colorado Supreme Court is hearing an appeal to what's commonly called the Martinez case. Teenagers filed suit against the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission to mandate that the development of oil and gas in Colorado be regulated subject to the protection of public health, safety, and welfare, including protection of the environment and wildlife resources. We respectfully request that you, the City Council, put forward a motion to direct your city attorney to file an amicus brief in support of the teenagers who filed suit against the COGCC. Thank you. And finally, because extractions plans cover such a vast area, because their plans are unknown to most residents, and because the impact of the city's infrastructure and the health and safety of your residents and the environment, we urge the council to declare a one-year moratorium. Adams County had a moratorium, as you would recall also. 
During that time, staff can determine our baseline air quality while also informing all residents of this zoning change of monumental consequence. Isn't it time that city commerce stand tall and let everyone know that as a city, we are no longer passive when it comes to industrial impacts on our children, their health and safety, and on our air and water? Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments from the council? No? Saying none? Mr. Yeah, Douglas. Of course you do. Thank you. You know, I think um, what um, Susan Noble brought up, um, we had a lot of those discussions back in 2011 12 uh, about moratorium, all that, and with that came those regulations. So we, we have been down that road. Um, so that's where we're at now with the regulations. Um, so I feel not to repeat that only because of the way the state statute is right now. I understand about the Martinez case, but as far as moratorium, I don't think we need to go that route. I think that um, to have fair discussion and, and, and have the citizens come out, be able to talk before something happens, not after. I think it need to be proactive. And I think some of the things that, things that you stated, um, something that we, could, that we could do. I mean, we're here and we represent the citizens of, of Commerce City, so we, we make sure everything that is addressed to us you get an answer. Sometimes it may not be um, what the citizens want or like, um, but as long as I've been here, the council uh, collectively have gotten together and put things forward where it's fair. And um, so I think I w I'm going to ask if we could have study sessions on uh, updating the public on our regulations and then bringing in new talks too. I mean, I'm sorry, a new discussion. Uh, about today's oil and gas issues and, and not wait, um, you know, months down the road because this is something of urgency. If I may, as part of the monthly update on the second regular meeting of every month, there will be an update that involves uh, some review of our regulations as well. Um, I would note the comment on the Martinez brief. I have been in talks with other attorneys about the possibility of filing an amicus brief or participating in one on behalf of the city that I'll present to the council um, shortly. Okay. Yeah. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to call next Tamara Graf. Uh, Mr. Mayor, may I yes. just have a quick moment before you do that to lower the blinds? Sure, absolutely. Go ahead and lower the blinds. Thank you. Uh, while you're doing that, I'd like to try to get everybody to be... Uh, compassionate about the three-minute warning so that because uh, we have a, a lengthy agenda oh so. sure cut me off now yeah, I'm <laughs> trying to be nice let everybody else go over <laughs> that's okay I hate speaking in public council members mr. mayor thank you for listening to us I won't de I won't beat a dead horse much more but I do wanted to bring wanted Name to bring an address sorry <laughs> okay. Tam Tamara Graf 15862 East 107th Avenue in, in the reunion Buffalo Mesa area so I was made aware about the proposed tracking sites um, because I am a mineral rights owner and I have been doing some more research particularly around the health risks with fracking being so close to homes and just wanted to share some of that research that I found with you um, there's certainly a ton out there but I'll I'll just condense it for you for our three minutes. Um, this is from an article with WESA.FM, so it's a public radio outside of Pittsburgh. Um, and just to, to share with you, a pediatrician who uh, is being interviewed is saying, I'm a retired pediatrician, so I've always reflected on what could impact children in particular because they're such a vulnerable population. I've been a co-author of a couple of peer-reviewed papers, including published in October of 2017 on the neurological impacts of children of several components that are emitted during fracking particulate matter, ozone, benzene. They are significant. There was a recent Denver 7 um, news story about a boy in Erie who had an 85th percentile of benzene in his blood. I work at High Point Academy and have for the last nine years, and so the kids in our area are dear and near to my heart. I love them. Um, and I'm really concerned about the, the proximity of these sites to our children. So I just ask that we continue to talk about our, our land usage 
um, crossing over residential and industrial uses, whether it's two miles under the ground or on top of it. Um, I'm just I'm worried about our kids and their health. So thank you for your considerations and keeping us in the loop and advocating for the citizens, especially the short ones. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for coming in this evening. Okay, Stephanie Silvey. Good evening. I'm Stephanie Silvey, and we have lived at 10487 Uray Street since 2004. Um, this is a new experience for me, um, pretty exciting. Um, oil and gas is also a new experience for me. I have a background in music education. I had no idea I would ever need to be educated in oil and gas extraction, not to mention it being in my neighborhood. Um, but even though I have zero experience and extremely limited knowledge, I don't feel like it should be discounted. The instinct that I had when I received notification that there could possibly be an extraction well in my neighborhood, <laughs> that's shocking. It's alarming. And I would, I would presume that if you all received the same notification from your neighbor or friend, not via a letter or a professional means, you would all be equally as alarmed. And so not only am I a member of the community and I've chosen to live here for some time, um, I'm a mom. <laughs> um, it's horrifying to think um, about the what if in this kind of a situation. When there is a well anywhere near residential, the, of course, the possibility of horrific things happening is so slim. I mean, really. The oil and gas companies don't want horrifying things to happen. We know that. But they can't control it as well as we can't control it. So what I propose to you is to stop it from happening altogether. Hydraulic fracking does not belong in urban or suburban communities. It should be elsewhere where my children and your children do not play and eat and sleep. It doesn't belong there. It doesn't belong anywhere where we all live. So I implore you to go to bat for the community, for the city, but most importantly, for the people who live here, and I know we, that's what that means, community, city, but it's the people that live here. I implore you to work hard and help us help you figure out how to get this out of the conversation whatsoever. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Shannon Wester. Hi. Thank you Hi. guys for just um, letting us speak to you. Um, you know, I come as a Metro District representative, so. Um, First of all, address, 9495 East 106th Place in Henderson. Um, I've owned property in the Bell Creek neighborhood since 2001. Um, so obviously I'm concerned by all of the issues. Um, from a metro district standpoint, um, the one that I really want to highlight is, you know, like Lori had spoken earlier, is the realignment of Bell Creek Boulevard. I know it's obviously the best for the retail across the street. I do personally feel that it's going to be extremely unsightly um, being that close to the water tank um, and just want to make sure that it's addressed um, before we get past, you know, a certain point and then are trying to revert back. So, and then obviously, um, as far as parking goes, I know the district is more than willing to work with you too as far as, you know, the restructuring of the median on 109th as well. So please reach out and let us know how we can help. Great. Thank you. Eric 
Good, my son. Good evening. Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, um, my concerns are very similar to some of the other concerns brought up tonight about the uh, situation with drilling and fracking. Um, we were told we've been to many meetings. We've met, actually met with lawyers to represent us and our mineral rights. We live at 11030 River Oaks Lane in Henderson, Colorado. And we've owned two homes in this area, and we don't want our home values affected by drilling. Uh, our property taxes pay for the infrastructure of the city, and if our property taxes are lowered, we're not going to have money to pay for the infrastructure we currently have or any new infrastructure. We were told in many of these meetings that the fracking chemicals will be hauled out of the area, actually out of the state, to North Dakota. This will add 55,000 trucks to the, yeah, to the intersection of Highway 85 and 104th. So we're talking about creating new entrances to Bell Creek. We're talking about making changes to that intersection. Per year, it's going to add 55,000 trucks to that intersection. I see accidents from my window of my home on a regular basis on 104th and 112th. There's been in many people killed on Highway 85 and 112th, motorcyclists. The power box there has been hit twice where we've lost power because people have been killed at that intersection. And now you're going to add 55,000 more trucks all hauling toxic chemicals through that intersection and hauling them all the way to North Dakota. So I do think the city council has a say in this. I do think the mayor has a say in this because it's going to affect the infrastructure of this area. That intersection is already overtasked. You're moving the entrance to Bell Creek, and you're going to have to build even more infrastructure there. They're adding a truck stop to 104th and Highway 2. Well, one of the reasons they're adding that truck stop is they're seeing the increased trucking. The rock trucks on Highway 85... Hmm? So one of the proposals is, is, is there any way we can add a fee to those trucks? If we're going to have trucks hauling dangerous chemicals out of our area through that infrastructure and through that intersection, should there be some type of fee on each truck? You're talking 55,000 trucks per year hauling da dangerous chemicals through our neighborhood. I mean, we already know fracking causes issues, but what about the fluid being hauled out of state? The company also only took out a $100,000 bond to cover any damages for the whole area, for all their fracking wells, all their drill sites. So there's $100,000 to pay to any damages. $100,000 damages wouldn't cover one house. We've also noted that we live in a beautiful area. We have a lot of resources in this area for people to come visit. One of the things that draws people to this area is the arsenal, the wildlife area. Our wildlife area includes golden eagles. Two have been spotted on the pads near or where their proposed pads are going to go. We've also seen bald eagles and we have bald eagle nests. Uh, is anybody in looking into the affect that the, all this fracking and all these trucks are going to have on the environment and the animals that live in the area, not just the people who live in the area. And I, sorry, I'm losing my voice. After the town hall in February, on February 21st, I was in touch with someone from Commerce City regarding my concerns because my neighborhood, River, River Oaks, has been going through this since January. We've already had our hearing with the Oil and Gas Commission. That hearing, the application hearing, was, our, was completed last month. So ours is already, like, full-blown going forward with Petro. So my question is, to follow up to the discussion that I had with the representative from Commerce City, they told me that they were going to file a response to the application. So at the hearing, Commerce City's voice was heard. I'm just wondering if that was done. Mr. Sheasley. I would have to defer to the um, city manager about the response, which is handled out of the staff. Side. Thank you. I know every referral we've received from the COGCC, we've provided a response back in writing 
uh, part of our monthly update will include what responses we've provided to applications on which we are a referral agency. So I believe what he's referring to, it's a state application. The city is a referral agency, so we have the opportunity to comment on those applications. And my question was, did you guys do that? Did you do that? It's my understanding we've provided a response to every application every COGCC application in the city. I don't know if this was an application that was in the city. It, and if we were referred it, and it, we'd have to identify exactly which application it was. Um, I'm not sure if it was it's a spacing. It's this one right here. I'd be. <coughs> we can follow up and see the, the one related to River Oaks, if we can identify what it was offline, um, what type of application if it was. If it, was it was a spacing a, application. If it was a spacing application, then that is the preliminary step in the process at the COGCC. It does not authorize drilling or the identification or the approval of the site or the method or manner of drilling at that point um, of those applications. But um, I can follow up with the Community Development Department to confirm uh, what response was provided. I believe, a, I believe it was and that there was an update in the city manager's update in the past month or so that included a copy of that, but we'd have to follow up to confirm. Thank you. Yeah, so I'll, the same as everyone else here, we pay our taxes. We do what we're supposed to do. We are all impacted by this fracking situation. Since we started this process back in January, no one has brought the oil and gas company online. We have met no representatives. I've reached out because I know that I've actually heard from Representative Douglas, and I've gotten responses on Facebook from from the from the board, from you guys. All I want is is for oil and gas. If they're going to come out here and do this, they need to be involved with us. We shouldn't have to be grassrooting this and coming before you guys saying, "Well, this is what we want." That should have already been in the cards, already in the works. You guys get notified. This notification of this hearing went to you guys back in January. So I'm trying to figure out why we're in May and we're just now talking about getting oil and gas together to talk to the citizens about all this proposed fracking. That's all I would like to know. All right. um, I want to answer a couple of questions. Um, first of all, as Mr. Douglas mentioned, <clears throat> we've been uh, diligent since 2011 to put together regulations concerning Commerce City. We know that these spacing applications are dealing with COGA and the state. We do not have jurisdiction on that. We are sending in responses. We can get you information on what those responses were. Um, sir, you mentioned uh, the trucks, the traffic. As part of the regulations that we put in place back in 2011, we have the ability to negotiate and impose, um, I'm trying to think of the term, Impact. impact fees from those those vehicles on city streets. And you also have to understand that Highway 85 is a state highway. We do not have the ability to regulate um, who uses or how often or how many um, vehicles utilize State Highway 85. Um, but we do have the ability to negotiate and and, and impose impact, impact fees um, for this type of uh, work that, that may or may not happen. And we haven't received any applications as far as I know for the city yet, but we also know they're coming. If it was up to me, I would make sure that the oil and gas companies were here talking to our residents. I have no control over those oil and gas companies and unless they're going to do something in Commerce City, then they're required to enter into an agreement with the city. And we will make them be a part of whatever we can make them be a part of to, to be transparent to our residents as to what they, they are planning to do. We have authority to, to deal with surface impacts. When it comes to anything downhole or below the surface, the state of Colorado is the, is the acting jurisdictional body. So we want to do our part to make sure everybody's safe. We live here too. We have kids here too. And so I live right across the street from you in River Run. So we want the safest, best community for everybody, not just ourselves, but every resident that lives here. So we hear what you're saying. I want to thank you all again for coming in. You're more than welcome to 
always contact the city about questions for anything. Uh, if you want to know what those responses were, please reach out to the, to the city manager's office. But we appreciate you coming in this evening. Thank you. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. All right. That gets us through citizen communication. We'll now move. Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. I can provide one quick update regarding Bell Creek, no parking, fire lane signs. Okay. Uh, despite direction not to install the signs, the signs were installed this morning. They will be taken down tomorrow. All right. Hopefully all the folks in Bell Creek heard that. They will be taken down tomorrow. I have one person in the audience raising their hand. Ma'am, did you want to speak during citizen communication? I do. Please come forward and state your name and address for the record. Nicolie Baker, 3796 East 64th Avenue. I'm here regarding our street. Uh, we had uh, Suncor put a, a big pipeline underneath our street, no problem. We had Excel put a big pipe down our street, no problem. South Adams County Water came and put a line down our street and, and we now have a lane and a half. We have been on the schedule to have our whole street retopped for some time, but because we're mostly industrial and few houses, it just keeps getting pushed back and, and nothing is, is getting done. And, and now with the, the potholes on each side and the heavy drop off and the fact that we don't have a full two lanes and all the truck traffic, there are times that I just kind of park as close to the edge as I can and let the trucks go by me because there's not room on the, on the street for both of us. Uh, and on top of that, and, and so that, that's, that's my big concern, that, that our street has to be moved forward as far as the resurfacing, not just more patches, but, but actual pavement on it. The second issue we have is the drainage at our driveway is four feet deep. The drain hole on, to the west of us where the water has to drain out is six foot deep. The ground level at that six foot location is four foot deep. We've had the city come uh, dig it out. We've dug it out. Our neighbor has dug it out. But the real problem when the street is, is resurfaced is, is it's got to drain. It, water isn't gonna miraculously get from the pipe down the hill. So uh, those are my, my two concerns. I heard the gentleman talking about no parking. We weren't notified when no parking signs went up either. They just appeared like the flowers in May. Uh, and there's not a lot of parking on our street most of it is the uh, diesel mechanic uh, east of us, and they have a tiny little lot and not enough room to get trucks in and out. And so they park there, and they know how to deal with the no parking signs. They just park in front of them, so you don't know that they're there. And as far as I know, there's no tickets that have ever gone out to them. I'm okay with that. They, they need the room. I would be more in favor of just removing the signs except right at the corner where you turn and there's a truck. But that, that's my big concern. Our street needs some serious attention. Well, thank you for coming in, Nicolay. Um, first and foremost, talk about the parking on your street. Uh, there is a business over there that um, has been uh, having our officers out there on a regular basis. It's an ongoing investigation. They say they can't have people uh, being able to, to leave their business without, because they can't see around these trucks that are parking and loading. So our police department's currently trying to enforce those trucks that park in the middle of the road and are trying to, lo trying to load their trucks, and they're actually double parking. Mm -hmm. So again, it was a safety issue, why those signs went up. Um, industrial area and trying to reduce the trucks blocking visibility for people trying to enter or exit a driveway. Um, when it comes to your street repairs and improvements, 
I would ask the city manager or uh, the director of public works who's here. Maria, if you want to come up and, and uh, uh, say anything about um, her street, the repairs with South Adams, because South Adams is a separate governing entity, um, what she can expect to happen and when. Please. Sorry. Yes, certainly. Um, I don't know the location off the top of my head, but we'll certainly uh, go out there tomorrow or later this week and see what we can do and then coordinate with South Adams for any necessary repairs. Good. Nick Lee, would you please uh, see Maria after you're done at the podium and give her your address so that she can make sure that Public Works is out there tomorrow? Because if South Adams is doing some work, they need to make sure that they put the road back together the way it's supposed to be. And uh, I, I think it's important time to remind everybody that we do have an app that you can get on your phone for those people that have smartphones. It's called Go Request. You can go on there, you can take a picture of a problem, whether it be a pothole, a drainage issue, parking issue. It will GPS locate where you're at. It'll identify the location and then it'll give you opportunity to take a picture and add the picture and make notes. That is submitted right off your phone, goes right to the department that would handle that at the city and you'll get a response within 24 hours of that request going into place. They'll also contact you and let you know by email of the repair or how they handled taking care of the problem. So that could be very helpful for people that want to file a, a request with the city to get proper attention and we can track it that, it that they were able to respond and identify that they got your request within 24 hours and how they handled fixing it. So street light out, whatever. But thank you, Nicoly. Please see Maria. Now, before I continue, is there anyone else in the audience who showed up for citizen communication that did not get the opportunity to speak yet? All right, we're going to move forward in our agenda. We have the approval of the minutes for January 22nd, 2018. I'm open for a motion to approve those minutes. Uh, Mr. Teeter. I believe we have to excuse uh, Mr. Diaz. I didn't have anything on here for an excused it's absence. Mayor Ford. Um, it, it doesn't matter if somebody was present or not for the meeting as long as they reviewed them. As long as uh, they okay. changed okay. legal interpretation this year. Right. Make a motion, make, make a motion to move, approve the minutes for May, January 22nd, 2018. Thank you. All right, Mr. Douglas. Second. Se I have a motion and a second to approve those meeting minutes. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion is carried. Me, yes, ma'am. Up again, two things. Um, could you please tell me who the second was on the minutes? Yeah, Mr. Douglas. Okay, and then the second thing, may I ask for another quick moment to interrupt you so that I may lift the screen? That's fine. And while you're lifting the screen, I know we had some folks uh, join us um, later after I had already made an announcement, but I'm going to make it again for people viewing at home or for people who showed up here after uh, the first notification. Our electronic system is out for our screen that's no, behind the council. It's also out for our computers up here at the dais. <laughs> so if you're watching at home, you're more than welcome to go and see um, the uh, layout of, the, of each plan for each item that's being discussed tonight on our website. And for those folks in the audience, my apologies. Um, they were working at 3.30 this afternoon. Something happened to the system and they will get it corrected, but uh, uh, we want to apologize for not having that, and please bear with us through the meeting because none of our communications up here for me to identify a council member that wants to speak or someone that wants to make a motion without getting hand signals for this evening. And I apologize, I can't the screen. No, so the screens are out too, huh? It's all right. All right, next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. The consent agenda includes items that are routine, procedural, informational, self-explanatory, and non-controversial. They are presented to council for a single motion and vote. Any member of council may ask to remove a specific item for further discussion and a separate vote. Tonight there are 10 items listed under the consent agenda. Does anyone on the council wish to remove an item off of the consent agenda? Mr. Douglas. Yes. Resolution 2018-38. Resolution. Resolution what? 
Uh, resolution 28, sorry, 2018 dash 38. 2018 dash 38. Mm -hmm. Resolution approving amendments to design service contract with All right. Eagle Point Recreation Center. I've got that one down. Is there anyone else that wants to remove an item off the consent agenda? Seeing none, then we have nine. Will the city attorney please read those nine titles of the consent agenda items to be taken a roll call on? Uh, Mayor Ford, if you could have a motion. For approval of the consent agenda. All right, I'm First. open for a. Uh, now we're losing that. All right, microphones are going out too. It looks like. Not good. So, uh, we can still do this, Mr. Huseman. All right. Is there a second? Mr. Diaz, second. I have a motion for Mr. Huseman and a second from Mr. Diaz to approve the consent agenda. Will the city attorney please read the titles of the nine items on the consent agenda and please do it loudly so everybody can hear the best that you can. <laughs> Resolution 2018-29, resolution authorizing response letter regarding the I-270 Vasquez Boulevard Planning Environmental Linkage Study Early Action Improvement Projects. Resolution 2018-30, resolution authorizing response letter regarding the US 85, I-76, and 124th Avenue, NEPA process. Resolution 2018-31, resolution approving an intergovernmental agreement with the Colorado Department of Transportation for installation of improvements associated with a low bridge warning system. Resolution 2018-32, resolution approving the Adams County Collaborative Transportation Planning Agreement to establish the Adams County Council of Governments ADCOG sub-regional forum process. Among the city of Arvada, the city of Aurora, the town of Bennett, the city of Brighton, the city of Commerce City, the city of Federal Heights, the town of Loch Bowie, the city of North Glen, the city of Thornton, the th city of Westminster, and Adams County. Resolution 2018-33, resolution approving amendment to funding agreement with the state of Colorado Department of Natural Resources relating to the Colorado Natural Resources to Foundation Fund. Resolution 2018-34, resolution appointing members to designated boards and commissions of Commerce City. Resolution 2018-36, resolution confirming the city's priority transportation projects. Ordinance Z-94718, an ordinance rezoning from I-3 to C-3, the property described in Exhibit A attached here to and made a park hereof located at 6091 Dexter Street, Commerce City, Colorado, and amending the zoning map of the city of Commerce City, Colorado to reflect said rezoning. Ordinance 2165, an ordinance amending section 12-5006, of the Commerce City Revised Municipal Code to allow the permitted possession of open containers containing fermented malt beverages and Venus liquors in city recreation facilities. Thank you. I have a motion and a second. The titles have all been read. I'll ask for a roll call vote. Clerk, will you please call the roll? Thank you. <clears throat> Councilman Madeira? Yes. Councilman Guardiola? Yes. Councilwoman Elliott. Yes. Councilwoman Frank. Yes. Councilman Diaz. Yes. Councilman Huseman. Yes. Councilman Douglas. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Teeter. Yes. Mayor Ford. Yes. Mr. Mayor, your vote is 9 I, 0 nay. For the record, the consent agenda is approved unanimously by the City Council this evening. Now we'll take up resolution 2018-38. Mr. Douglas. Yes. Um, the reason why I pull this off is um, I'm looking at Eagle Point scope development, and I notice the stress goal, the stretch goals, uh, the kitchen upgrade has been scratched out. And I know back then we were talking about the improvements with the rec center. That was one thing that council highlighted was kitchen upgrades because of that ongoing uh, gas-lit stove and uh, the ability to do a little bit more in that kitchen than they, norm than they have right now. And so I was surprised to see that the kitchen upgrades were scratched out with no explanation because we've had several study sessions on this and now one time was the kitchen upgrade uh, was put out there was going to be scratched. I'll ask the uh, design team to provide you a more detailed answer. I think the original concept at the time was to convert the kitchen to a full commercial kitchen, which I know was not included in the final design. 
Can somebody from the design team provide a little bit more detail? Mr. Hergenrader is on his way up. Thank you, Laura. Uh, good evening, members of City Council. Uh, Councilman Douglas, you're absolutely right. There was a lot of deliberation as we were going through the early schematic design phases, and we identified a number of code issues that was really going to preclude us uh, from designing that into a full kitchen because of all the knock-on effects that would have as it related to code, the operations, and the functioning of the facility is essentially a restaurant that would be subject to those types of codes. So the... Uh, uh, concept then was to leave the kitchen facility essentially as it was and to not create any upgrades and you just mentioned having to put in a range hood and all the other things that would be uh, involved with the code as it relates to when the facility was last upgraded which was in the 1990s to now the code has changed significantly as it relates to those types of issues uh, specifically related to the code as well as the fire suppression system that also relates to the types of uh, hoods that we'd be talking about. Okay. Well, I, I know this project was supposed to be like around $10 million. It's now $17 million, correct? That's correct. Okay, so that's $7 million additional from what we spoke when we were talking about these upgrades to the rec center. So for something to say the code's been changed, I know it's not going to be $7 million what the change is. I mean... That's something that should have been brought up to say, hey, you know, we always have these um, change orders come up. I'm not happy about change orders. I understand that things come up and they weren't there before. But um, as to just scrub that and give the reason of the codes and update and the fire suppression, those are codes that have to be put in. Those are, you know, I think $10,000 per square inch or something like that. But they don't add up to $7 million. You're right, Councilman, and, it, and uh, there were actually, and I apologize because you don't have the slides, you may have the slides in front of you in paper, uh, there were actually a number of competing trade-offs that we went through, and the ladder that we climbed included those base uh, items for upgrading and renovating the recreation center that, that were considered base case, and that was part of the original Quality Community for a Lifetime uh, initiative that identified what the base items were going to be in terms of amenities. The second layer was we conducted a facility condition assessment of the facility, and we identified the key mechanical and electrical upgrades that were sorely in need of upgrading. The third tier was what we called stretch goals, and the actual kitchen upgrades or renovations that you're referring to were part of the stretch goals. And on top of that, there were additional enhancements. Uh, there were about six items that were identified as additional enhancements that when all taken together, there was a, a very deliberate process that we went through, and I believe we included this in, in study sessions, where we went through and looked at the trade-offs and the estimated range of cost for each of those items and the items that made it through the wicket, so to speak, were all of the items that are on this list, and apologies, you can't, can't see that. Uh, but the kitchen upgrades, for the reasons I mentioned earlier, uh, were, were not uh, invoked by either the project management team, city management team, or city council at that time. Well, either I was out of town um, in that first meeting in March, um, but other study session I've, 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 I've attended. Um, and I'd be happy to follow up, and we could go back and, and uh, pull that information, uh, Councilman, from those study sessions that we had. But you're absolutely right. The, the kitchen upgrades out of the $7 million differential uh, wouldn't have, wouldn't have, wouldn't have uh, tipped the scales, but it was conflicted out with the trade-offs that were identified on these lists. Yeah, I'm not aware of those trade-offs. And that, to me, it's, I know stretch goals I mean it was like a Christmas list, but... That kitchen upgrade that was brought brought up several times in different many, in different ways from different council members is that kitchen, and to leave that that type of that type of um, infrastructure in that facility, that's like um, say you're going to have heart surgery, but you do everything else except replace the heart, and that's the one thing that that was was. Right. We'll be replaced. I mean, that sure. doesn't, that, I don't, I don't equate to that because the kitchen, 
upgrade. There'd have to be some, something dramatic. Right. It's just bringing things up to code and, and, and making use of that. Um, I'm sorry, but like I said, they said this, I mean, we're, you know, we're right now, we're, we're trying to um, approve this tonight. Um, but like I said, that really got my attention that that was not included and that was highlighted by council. We spoke of, we're doing any kind of changes within the, in that rec center that we need to upgrade that kitchen because the senior, senior um, uh, center, those seniors, re, they rely on that kitchen. And right now, functionally, it's, it's old and uh, inadequate. So we need to bring that up to date. And I know there was, you know, as far as moving walls and all that stuff and the gas line and everything, mm -hmm. but that was on top of the list when it came to uh, what the council wanted at that time. Okay. The uh, decision was not just, as I recall, it was not just a capital cost decision. It was also an operational issue because the kitchen would need to function essentially as and be regulated similar to an actual restaurant. So that was going to create an operational burden for the facility that it had not had in the past as well. Um, for a, as, a, as a reminder, some of the other items that were identified in the stretch goals, and Councilman, I don't know if you, you can see this or not on your, your screen or if you have this handout. Some of the other items that were identified as part of the stretch goals and the additional enhancements that really was what grew the scope of the project as well as the budget from 10 to 17 million. And that also took into account market conditions that we've been experiencing a, a very costly market. Uh, included essentially the uh, improved flow and the spectator space areas, which were high on the list of uh, a lot of the parents who wanted to be able to see their, their kids. Uh, technology improvements, including a technology laboratory. Parking lot improvements. Um, steam room was added back in, which was taken out. Uh, facility recabling and IT and audiovisual upgrades, also for the seniors and for the others that use that. Uh, renovations to the existing restrooms. Uh, the existing restrooms were not originally going to be renovated, but those were added uh, as an amenity back in based on uh, comments that we received. Three additional family locker rooms. And uh, upgrades to the uh, high intensity training, interval training, and the yoga wellness area. So all of those areas that I just mentioned were also in competition for the kitchen upgrade. And as I mentioned, there was the issue of moving this from not just a capital expenditure consideration, but also to an ongoing operational expenditure consideration. So I would be more than happy to go back and pull our team and pull that information forward to you again. But I believe it was a fairly deliberate decision. Uh, to not move forward with that kitchen. Well, I know a lot of things are talked about and um, discussed behind the scenes. I mean, you know, we rely on our city manager to operate uh, on a daily basis for the city. Uh, and our position, you know, as far as approving projects like this is also looking at what are the needs and desire of to make this functional. So, so are you telling me that the kitchen can remain the same as it is right now, having that gas stove running 24 hours a day and it's in its uh, present state right now? Uh, I'm going to check with Carolyn Keith, who's the Director of Parks, Recreation, and Golf. Uh, Carolyn, do you, do you recall? I think, I think we were actually shutting that gas off as part of this exercise. I do have a... Some quick information. As Mr. Hergenrader mentioned, we can provide the background when City Council study sessions occurred that made some of the key decisions about the scope of the project. We believe that occurred at the July 24th, 2017 study session, but we can provide that background. Okay. I think well, I was there a discussion. At, I was there at that meeting, and I do not remember the kitchen upgrade being scratched off. We'll certainly and have it, to verify all of the yeah. information, but okay. we can provide a report back to the back to the city council that would have been a key decision the city council would right. have weighed in on and at that time it wasn't 17 million either it was more like 10 million at that time i think that was pre having our designer on board okay. so um, these were just the list of the amenities with with the concepts of what could be afforded within the budget at that time okay mr Huseman. Thanks, sir. 
Um, so you just said that all the changes that you mentioned were pre-design contract, correct? Uh, no, I don't know that they were all pre-design contract. A lot of these concepts were identified as we pulled the community and received input from the community in a series of outreach events. Okay. And then, and then as we move forward with the conceptual design, once the designer was on board, uh, it was at that time that concepts related to we want to keep the steam room and we want to do other things that I mentioned on that list were surfaced. So all that surfaced after the initial contract was written? Uh, a number of those things did, yes. A number of those things. So can you break down for us which things needed to be changed in order to warrant a 65% increase in contract price? Uh, a number of those items were related to market conditions, as I mentioned. Uh, a number of those costs. Oh, okay. We, time, we, uh, we, we time have out. a time out. market conditions for the mm -hmm. design team. No, not for the design team. But well, this for the contract is for this contract is for the architect. Right. So I'm trying to get to why the architectural fees went up by 65 percent. Uh, because of the types of scope items that you see on this on this list. So every one of these scope items were done after the initial contract was signed in February of 2017? Councilman, I don't, I don't recall. A number of these items were brought right. up and socialized as part of the outreach with the community and then codified once the design team came on board in terms of specific decisions presented or requested by city council. So as the bond program manager, you're standing there and asking us to approve a change order for 65% of the initial value of that contract for design services, but you can't tell us which items are causing that cost to go up by that much? No, of course I can tell you which items. Okay, well that's what I'm asking for. The vast majority of these costs are actually related to a construction and design packaging scheme. The original concept was to have a single construction bid for the project. As we move forward through the process, we identified and we specifically requested of the designer that they break out a separate package for the foundations and the outside walls for the therapy pool area because that was not in their original scope. So that was a significant change. It required the architect to provide and produce numerous additional drawings in order to support the regulatory process and the bidding process that was going to be required to keep that project on schedule. Uh, also not included in that contract were IT upgrades, FF&E support, audiovisual, and a number of other uh, specific items that made up the scope of that work. If I might add, there is a, a slide in the presentation in the packet that intends to summarize the changes in scope that resulted in the increased fee. And there were a number of the things that Mr. Hergenrader mentioned uh, three additional family changing rooms, renovations to the restrooms near the gymnasium, changing of the restrooms near the multi-purpose rooms in the senior center to family assisted restrooms, the steam, the new steam room, the lifeguard room and added square footage in the therapy pool area, the facility recabling and the IT AV upgrades, additional HVAC modifications and existing pool boiler, boiler replacement and some initial work on potentially replacing the running track. So that change in scope, the architect originally submitted a proposal for that additional work. Uh, the program management team, along with city staff, negotiated uh, a lower amount uh, in an effort to reach agreement with the architects on the additional scope. Thank you. So back to my original question. All those items were done after the initial design contract was awarded in February 2017. These are all changes in scope after the design contract was awarded. Thank you. The one other thing I did see on that is another thing that was item was uh, selected interior and exterior public art will need electrical and structural design support. That's increasing the cost? It is. Those were costs not anticipated at the yeah. time that the architect was on board. So a little bit of feedback. A month ago, we all voted and approved that but nothing in the presentation over the design that was selected and how much it was going to cost indicated to us that it was going to cause an additional fee for design services. So I think that that was a little bit uh, poorly handled. Thank you. Mr. Wardiola. So uh, looking back, how much would it be to get the kitchen upgrade again? Councilman, I couldn't tell you. What because I think... I think I think we have to be very fair with both our rec centers. And we need to have a kitchen 
Um, I don't know if it has to be commercial, but it has to be usable for our residents down in the core city um, if we're going to have it up in the northern range. So I, I would definitely want to see staff look into that to see how much more. I mean, we're over budget, what, $7 million, you said, Steve? Yeah. Um, a kitchen upgrade, I think it, it would be right for us to vote on something like that for our, all our residents. One, uh, one key point of clarification, the existing kitchen at Eagle Point Recreation Center essentially serves as a catering kitchen. It's not set up as a full commercial kitchen where food uh, can be prepared on site. Uh, the kitchen at the Bison Ridge Recreation Center is also designed as a catering kitchen. It is bigger because it's a bigger building, but it's also not been designed and built as a commercial kitchen. Uh, when you see the tour on Friday, that'll make a little bit more sense. It's got things like warming ovens and, and tables and trays for uh, final preparation of food, but it's not a commercial kitchen. And that was done intentionally because Eagle Point was not going to have a full commercial kitchen. So, so if you're saying that, Brian, then why do we want to make it a commercial kitchen? Like he's saying that it would cost more to make it a commercial kitchen. That was one of the discussion points early on was should the existing kitchen at Eagle Point be converted to a commercial kitchen, city council, uh, with input from the design team and the project management team ultimately decided not to do that. So it's essentially staying in its current configuration. It can serve as a, what they call a catering kitchen to warm food and to serve food, but it's not intended to be a kitchen where you can um, prepare food because it doesn't meet all of the requirements under the code uh, to actually cook and prepare food, if that makes sense. I'd be happy to provide additional background, too, on the differences between a catering kitchen and a commercial kitchen. Councilwoman Elliott. Thank you, Mayor. And it was to my understanding that it was going to remain a catering kitchen. So I don't know where the disconnect or miscommunication is to look at the funding for commercial kitchen, because I think what you and I had talked about that. We were going to keep maintain it as a catering kitchen because it doesn't necessarily need that particular of an upgrade because we don't anticipate the use being much more than what it has been. I mean, it served its purpose for all these years. So in my mind, I still just can't understand why we can't just upgrade what we have just to maintain the same level of, of, of uh, service that it is, catering kitchen. All right. Uh, I see Carolyn, uh, Director of Parks, Rec, and Golf, just ran up here. Uh, Carolyn, do you want to uh, help address this? Honorable Mayor, members of City Council, um, the upgrades were intended to remain as a catering kitchen. We've um, never intended a commercial kitchen. Uh, we were looking at replacing the gas stove element. Um, there are no code violations. I really want to make that clear. The kitchen as it currently exists is usable for our purposes of today. Um, the gas stove has created some issues where when the wind is blowing, it will push that natural gas and will get a little bit of a smell. It is in no way a code violation or a safety issue. Um, but, it, but there's a perception. And we were looking at the idea of a renovation of the kitchen for catering purposes that would also allow for us um, potentially to do some cooking type classes, some program classes with, with the remodel. But when, honestly, what I recall, when we looked at the costs and the, all the lists of things and the um, cost benefit of making those changes, that's what I recall where it kind of slid down the list. But the exact information that was presented in, in July to council, we'd certainly have to go back and pull that together. But the renovation would continue as a catering type kitchen. It Thank would make you. the space a lot more usable. Mr. Douglas. Um, I did not mention it was going to be a commercial kitchen. That's not what my the intent was for the scratch up the upgrades. And I asked, is, is that gas stove still going to be turned on? I mean, left left on. And, and um, um, Carolyn, Carolyn, director for Parks and Rec, said yes. We need to change that out. I, I don't care code or not. 
but to have that old gas stove still running and it's, you know, if or as far as cooking and all that, change that up. We're spending seven million dollars more to do these all these things, and we cannot change that in the kitchen. That that does not make sense. What well, we can do, Mr. McBroom. It was not included in the scope of the project. We can certainly explore if there are still opportunities to do that. Are you meaning the appliance itself, upgrading the appliance itself? Yes, yes. Take that thing out of there. I mean, that's like it's, it's like having a, a beautiful car, but you you got a bunch of uh, uh, hamsters running the wheels. I mean, it's, it looks good on the outside, but the inside is, is, is old. That's all I'm asking. And that's part of the up. Uh, if, if we're keeping that and we add the $7 million, someone's not doing their job. Because I have to answer to the, our citizens of why is that thing still there? We did all this beautiful renovation of our rec center and we still had a guest over there. That doesn't make sense. Well, the reason it's still there is because it, replacing it wasn't included in the scope of the project. We can, we can explore and see what options there are without getting into code upgrade issues that would add significant cost or have other structural issues. But the scope did not include replacing okay. the stove. Because I'm sure, you know, if you got a gas, I have a gas stove. I can turn it on, turn it off. We need something like that. And I don't have a compression hood. And, and today, you don't even have to have a, a ventilation going out of your house. It's within inside the, the um, confined area. It's a low gas, and you can't have the ability to turn on and off. So, uh, I mean, you know, when you see something like this here, uh, it, it's all visual, okay? So understand, when you put something on, on the agenda and you cross it out, something that we talked about, that's gonna, that got my attention. Had that not been in there, I would have never known that. You know that? Councilman, I think in the documentation, and we'll go back through the record, I believe that that was a very deliberate decision made as part of an entire inclusive process with all parties involved. We'll go back and look through that. If you're asking for an affirmative request for us to look at a possible addition to the scope of the project, we're happy to take that away and explore what the options and the opportunities are uh, that would cause the replacement of that stove and any knock-on regulatory or code impacts that may be required. Uh, but that's not, that's not our decision as a program team. We'll need to look at the programming of the facility, the users, and the needs, and uh, we can pull that together if that's the request. Even if you took that out and replaced it with something that's very functional, would be great. But to hear these excuses and the reason why we didn't do something, and council made it very clear back then, they did not want that gas stove. And, and, and to make it a commercial, we knew it was going to cost money for commercial. We won't make that a commercial kitchen. We're not serve a restaurant purpose. We knew it was going to be a catering kitchen. But to keep that gas stove, that does not make sense. So I would appreciate you looking into that because be there's a minimal to cost to do that. I don't have to worry about fire suppression and all that. And I understand that because that was discussed. I mean, that was a part of our discussion. So let's just make this clear um, that small changes on there you know, here I spend, what, 20 minutes talking about this? And I shouldn't have said anything about that. So just to make it clear for, for, for future projects, let's be clear when we go through something. Something's been changed, whatever. Make it clear and, and noted and so that when it comes to us to approve on, on, on these items, it's been cleared up and there's no miss, um, um, uh, I can't think of the word, just, just get it right next time. Thank you. If I could just, uh, if I could just clarify, the reason we provided that information in the packet is to tell some of the backstory on how the scope of the project got to where it is. Also, wanted to clarify the project's not over budget. The scope of the project was increased, and as a result, the budget for the project was increased. Also, okay. Mr. Hughesman, um, has Ascenza Architecture provided you with an itemized breakdown for that change order? They have indeed. And have you provided that to us? Don't recall if that's okay. in the... What is the impact if this is not approved tonight and it's pushed off by two weeks? 
uh, it will have an impact on our ongoing construction yeah. administration okay. of right. a project that's in progress right now. Okay. My question is, what is the in impact? Uh, I can't tell you that specifically. Okay. Mr. McBroom, you want to uh, try to field that question? We'd be happy to provide the information. Uh, Ascenza uh, provided pretty detailed documentation on the change in scope that resulted in additional work on their part. Again, there was a negotiation with Ascenza Architects on the value of that work. No, no, no. The, the question is, if this was to be denied by the City Council tonight, what would the impact be on the construction of the Eagle Point? I'm afraid I don't have a better answer than Mr. Hergenrader. It is certainly on a tight timeline. Um, there have been some changes in scope. Our goal was still to try to complete the project by the end, uh, the end of this year. Um, I, I'm not sure. Um, I think uh, from what Mr. Hergenrader indicated, a, a key area of service that's ongoing is some construction administration work, some, some consulting work that they're providing uh, during construction of the renovation. Is that the key area? Is all the, is all the design work done? Uh, all of the design work is done. We're currently addressing all of the requests for information or RFIs and the submittals. Those are the critical path items right now that the design team is undertaking. And that's going to impact the turnaround time of the contractor being able to order the materials that they need in order to complete the project work. So. That is the closest that I can give you right now as to what the immediate impact is on the current design contract if it were not approved tonight. Thank you. Mr. Hughesman. I'm sorry. You just said that all the design work is already done, correct? Yes, the design work is completed. So we're in was construction administration right now. So was the work authorized to be done without the change order being approved then? The, some of the work was indeed started by the design team who didn't provide their proposal for the services until we were able to receive that here several months ago and review and negotiate the terms of that, which is why it's coming to you right now. So somebody has obligated the city to pay, spend money. That was I actually believe the architects have continued working in good faith while we negotiate the value of the change order. Okay, thank you. That's correct. All right, one more time, Mr. Douglas. Okay. Then I'm going to move on. All right. Um, uh, just to bring this up here, I know we, our first project we had was at water, that water park, and I know they were laid out their design and everything, and then we ended up with the final design. It showed it didn't have a bathroom in the back of the facility, of the construction, I mean, of the pool area. And at that time, they said that they could, they could not put a bathroom in in that area. If we did, we'd have to take one of the, one of the aquatics out because of cost. Um, they ended up not only making that uh, project go forward and be completed, they actually, they actually put a bathroom, as you know, in the back, of the back of the pool area so kids could go back there and do their business. Um, and then also uh, when that project was done, it was under budget. So... Um, and if you're saying that they're they're working right now on on uh, on faith, basically, uh, I couldn't see why t two, two more weeks till we get this stuff straight was is going to hurt them because they're still going to continue to do the work. It's just our approval, correct? Uh, it is, in fact, your approval. That right. We'll amend the contract that will allow them to be paid for the services that mm -hmm. they're performing. Yes. Right. So I'm not asking them to. Stop work. None of us are asking to stop work. It's just a clarification on the kitchen and the upgrades. I'm sure there are some upgrades in that kitchen, correct? I don't recall the specific other activities that were being performed in that kitchen. Okay. Well, with that answer, I think we just need to wait two weeks until we get an, an answer of what exactly they're going to be doing there. For the kitchen, the kitchen mm -hmm. upgrades, as Mr. McBroom indicated, would be new and additional scope above and beyond that which we're looking at right now. If there were a desire from council to explore that further, as I think we, we have uh, understood that message, that would be a new scope of work that would be uh, reviewed and, and negotiated, and that would also serve to amend this contract. Just to take the stove out and replace it. 
It's, it's, it's new scope, yes, and I don't know what the full extent of that replacement would involve from a code and regulatory standpoint. Okay. Any other discussion? Rick. No. The motion. No more discussion. I'm open for a motion. Mr. Teeter. Yes. I would like to make a motion to approve Rev resolution 2018-38, resolution approving amendments to design service contract for the Eagle Point Recreation Center with the caveat or whatever you want to call it to address the stove separately in the, down the road. Is there a second? Mr. Uh, Madera. Second. I have a motion and a second. <clears throat> Is there any discussion before I move on? Mr. Guardiola. So we're approving the 311980 but with caveat that they're looking into the stove repairment, or would that be included in that? He said that we need a new scope for that. So how does that go together? Mr. McBrew. If I understand the motion, it's a request to look at the possibility of replacing the stove. That would likely be a, an additional scope of work anyway with the architects in addition to a bunch of other costs related to actually doing the work. So we'd be happy to look at that. We'll certainly do that quickly in an effort to keep the project on its, uh, on its current schedule. Also, although not in the motion, uh, I've committed, it's no problem for us to provide uh, the extra detail behind uh, the architect's request uh, for some additional money in their contract. There's quite a bit of additional detail. Again, it was the subject of several weeks of negotiation with, uh, with the architects. All right. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? So, we could, a resolution I could do by voice, right? That's correct. All, right. all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Nay. All right. Could I please get a verbal on the names? Councilman Douglas? One? Mr. Wardiola? Was it no? Any others? So the vote is two to seven. Motion's carried. Um, we will have a study session to discuss a new stove and how the replacement and what that would entail. Thank you. All right. Moving on in our agenda. Next item is public hearings. I will remind council to use the public hearing portion to ask questions, but wait until the public hearing is closed to express opinions or indicate how you will vote. I'm gonna open the public hearing and invite the staff forward to give their presentation. If I could uh, just remind council and those watching without, a, without the ability to project the presentation, I believe Mr. Martinelli will intend to walk through his presentation as it's in the packet, so certainly follow along if you are able, uh, but it will certainly look and feel differently than it, than it normally does. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Mayor and Council, for uh, hearing this case tonight. Um, as, uh, City Manager Brian McMurray indicated, um, I will walk through the presentation that I have on my screen. Um, the version that I'm looking at should be identical to what you are looking at on your screens. Um, so let's get started. Um, this is case Z944-18, a request for a zone change from I-1 to I-2. Um, the applicant is Commercial Seat Metal Incorporated. Um, I'm going to give a brief rundown here of the introduction of this case type, as I know that we have a a few council members that are um, new to land use applications um, and have seen a, a, a couple now. Um, but the, chat, the request in front of you tonight is a zone change, um, which is the act of changing, is changing the zoning of a particular property. Um, that'll affect the types of uses that are legally allowed on that property and what um, developers can do with their land. Um, the zone change um, affects building setbacks, land requirements, design standards, and other regulations that are contained within the land development code, depending on that district. Um, so the subject property um, is at 8546 Quebec Street. Um, the property is currently zoned I-1. Um, the property is surrounded on the south and the east sides by I-2 properties. Um, there is the new way packaging supply facility directly to the north of this property. Um, and to the west of the property, there is a landscaping contractor that's currently zoned agricultural. 
Um, the future land use map that I'm pulling up here um, shows the subject property as well as some of the adjacent properties. Um, just to provide a little bit more clarification and background, um, the future land use plan is a component of the comprehensive plan that was adopted by um, the city in 2010, and it identifies um, the future land use for properties within the city. So there is a, a comprehensive plan in place for uh, if a property is to change its zoning, what that zoning should conform to based on surrounding land uses, um, transportation, and a number of other different issues. Um, so you can see that this property has a um, future land use designation of general industrial, which roughly equates to an I-2 or an I-3 zoning, um, and the surrounding land uses directly adjacent to it also have that designation. Um, so the site conditions, the property is currently undeveloped. Um, the property was platted at the time that the north property was platted in 2006. So the property to the north was developed with some of the drainage improvements on that north side. Um, so this is the second half of that development. Um, the applicant is requesting to rezone the subject property from I-1 to I-2. Uh, in that process, they have an administrative development plan under review at the city to construct an 18,000 square foot industrial building. Um, at that facility, they will be primarily conducting sheet metal fabrication. Um, if any of you are familiar with the Instel Seal site that recently came online about last year, um, this will be very similar to what they're doing, but on a smaller scale. Um, the proposed zone change from I-1 to I-2 is specifically requested um, to allow them to conduct outdoor storage in conjunction with the primary use. Um, my understanding from the applicant is that um, there will be a small amount of sheet metal storage that will comply with the outdoor storage regulations in the land development code and are necessary and this is necessary for their operations. So you can see on your screens the site plan um, for the subject property. Um, it breaks down the different components so about 5,600 square feet on the interior will be used for storage. Um, the remaining 10,000 square feet in the back will be for manufacturing uses and there's going to be about 2,400 square feet of office space um, in the main front for administrative offices. Um, there is going to be parking, there's going to be an access point to the south um, which will let off into the main parking area for customers um, and then the outdoor storage area will be behind a locked gate um, where the rest of the site will be contained. And then on the next sheet, you can see the architectural elevations, um, which are currently meeting the, uh, the land development code standards for industrial buildings. Um, <clears throat> the Planning Commission had the opportunity to hear this case last month. And based on this request, the Planning Commission believed that uh, the proposed rezoning was justified, um, was consistent with the future land use designation for the property. Um, they also noted that the development of an infill lot in the Irondale, Irondale area um, is a... Um, a key component of this. Um, this has been a target area for industrial growth in the city and an area that we're really focusing on. Um, the proposed use would be also harmonious with other similar land uses. Um, <clears throat> we're also going to go over here a little bit about the public improvements that would be required with this development. Um, no public improvement agreement was required at the time that they applied for the administrative development plan and zone change. Um, but as I mentioned before, this property was platted in 2006. And at that time, um, a public improvements agreement was completed. Um, it's going to require them to construct half of the city's minor collector roadway section um, and directly fronting the west portion of the property. Um, they'll be constructing a five-foot sidewalk, vertical curb and gutter, and any additional asphalt in a tree lawn. Um, that will match the landscaping sidewalk and tree lawn to the direct north that was constructed with the new way project. Um, this property will be required to pay three impact fees. Um, they'll be paying a water acquisition fee, a road impact fee, and a fire impact fee. Um, and as of May 7th, staff has received no request for additional information on this proposed land, uh, this proposed zone change. Um, and on April 3rd, 2018, the Planning Commission voted five to zero to recommend approval to City Council. Um, and I am available to answer any questions that you may have. Um, the applicant is also present tonight to answer questions as well. Thank you. Anyone on council have any questions for the staff at this time? Seeing none, applicant is present. Uh, would you like to come forward and add any additional information um, to the staff's report?
I think, uh, well, I, my name is Andrea Chase, and my husband and I, uh, Dan Chase, um, address is 5124 at Lehigh Lane in Sedalia. Uh, we are the owners of 8546 uh, Quebec Street. And I don't have a bunch to add to Dominic's presentation, um, but I do believe um, our requests from, for the zone change from I-1 to I-2 will allow us to properly uh, provide um, uh, a small amount of storage um, and in use um, in our uh, facility, and, um, and it would really um, be a harmonious add to that street um, without any um, impact that I can... Thank you. Um, while the applicant's at the podium, does anybody on council have any questions for the applicant at this time? Seeing none, thank you. Thanks. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to address the council on this matter? Seeing none, I'm going to close the public hearing. I'm open for a motion. Mr. Teeter. I'd like to make a motion to approve the findings and the recommendations of the Planning Commission on case Z-944-18. Is there a second? Councilwoman Frank. I'll second. I have a motion to second to approve the findings and recommendations of the Planning Commission. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion is carried. Now I'm open for a motion on the ordinance. Mr. Teeter. I'd like to make a motion and a second to introduce ordinance Z-944-18 by council as seated and approve the ordinance on first reading. Thank you. Mr. Huseman. Second. I have a motion and a second on the introduction of the ordinance. Well, the uh, attorney please read the title. Ordinance Z-94418, an ordinance rezoning from I-1 to I-2, the property described in Exhibit A, attached here to and made a part hereof, located at 8546 Quebec Street, Commerce City, Colorado, and amending the zoning map of the City of Commerce City, Colorado to reflect said rezoning. Thank you. Well, the clerk, please call the roll. <clears throat> Councilmember Hordiola. Hordiola, present. Oh, yes. <laughs> Councilmember Madera. Yes. Councilmember Elliott? Yes. Councilmember Frank? Yes. Councilmember Huseman? Yes. Councilmember Diaz? Yes. Councilmember Douglas? Yes. Mayor Pro Tim Teeter? Yes. Mayor Ford? Yes. Carries 9-0. Uh, All right. For the record, um, the rezoning has been introduced on first reading unanimously by the City Council. Thank you, folks, for coming in this evening. All right, moving on in the agenda, we have ordinances on first reading. We have ordinance... 2166. Is there anyone on council that has any questions regarding the ordinance? Seeing none. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to come forward and address council on the matter of ordinance 2166? Seeing none. I am open for a motion. Well, Mr. Huseman. I'd like to make a motion to introduce Ordinance 2166 by Council as seated and approve the ordinance on first reading. Thank you. Is there a second? Mr. Uh, Madera. Second. Will the City Attorney please read the title? Ordinance 2166, an ordinance amending the 2018 budget of the City of Commerce City, Colorado by the recognition of the Colorado Department of Transportation grant in the amount of $2,500 for click it or ticket efforts and the authorization of the expenditure thereof. Thank you. I'll ask for a roll call vote. Councilmember Hordiola? Yes. Councilmember Madera? Yes. Councilmember Elliott? Yes. Councilmember Frank? Yes. Councilmember Huseman? Yes. Councilmember Diaz? Yes. Councilmember Douglas? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Teeter? Yes. Mayor Ford? Yes. Carries 9 0. Thank you. For the record, Ordinance 2166 is uh, approved unanimously by the City Council this evening on first reading. Now we have ordinances on second reading. We have one, Ordinance Z-950-18. This ordinance was not approved unanimously on first reading. As such, is not included on the consent agenda. I'm open for a motion regarding Ordinance Z-950-18 on second and final reading. Mr. Madera. 
uh, move to approve ordinance Z950-18 on second and final reading. Thank you. Is there a second? Mr. Hughesman. Second the motion to approve ordinance Z950-18 on second and final reading. I have a motion and a second. Will the attorney please read that title? Ordinance Z95018, an ordinance rezoning from Ag to I-1, the property described in Exhibit A and attached here too, and made a part hereof located at the southwest corner of East 88th Avenue and Willow Street, Commerce City, Colorado, and amending the zoning map of the City of Commerce City, Colorado to reflect said rezoning. Will the clerk, clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Hordiola? Yes. Councilmember Madera? Yes. Councilmember Elliott? Yes. Councilmember Frank? Yes. Councilmember Hughesman? Yes. Councilmember Diaz? Yes. Councilmember Douglas? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Teeter? Yes. Mayor Ford? Yes. Carries 9 0. Thank you. For the record, Ordinance Z 950 18 is approved unanimously on second reading by the City Council this evening. That takes us into our presentation portion of the meeting. We're going to start with a presentation on the National League of Cities by the Commerce City Youth Commission. I'd like to ask all the youth commissioners to please come forward. Get up to the podium. Why don't you go through and introduce yourself so that we know who you are. And welcome. Hi. Uh, hello, Mayor and members of City Council. I'm Honora Hundle, and I'm a commissioner on the Youth Commission. What school do you go to? I go to York International. Okay. Hi. My name is Jasmine Carr, and um, I'm a commissioner from Commerce City Youth Commission, and I go to York International, and I'm a freshman. Thank you. Hello, my name is Tyler Vu. I'm the co-chair for the Commerce City Youth Commission, and I'm a sophomore at MC High School. Thank you. Hello. Hello, my name is Emmanuel Zamora, and I'm a, a youth commissioner as well for the Commerce City Youth Commission, and I go to the Anna City High School. Great. Thank you guys for all being here tonight. Don't be nervous. This is easy stuff. So um, we're on your side, so no reason to be concerned. Um, so we had a presentation prepared, but unfortunately, it's not going to work. So <laughs> we'll just go through each slide as if it was up there. Um, so basically, this presentation is going to be about our experience at the National League of Cities. And so um, the youth commissioners went as delegates re representing Commerce City, and there were around 2,000 city leaders. Some of um, the council members also went. Um, so on March 12th, uh, we attended many workshops, and the first uh, workshop we attended was like an opening session, and um, it was called Making Your Voices Heard, and it was just uh, during the session we talked about an elevator pitch, and uh, we contributed with other youth, uh, youth delegates, and the elevator pitch was just um, talking about how you can go up to city council members and other um, council members and talk about um, the problems that are going on now. And uh, we talked with other youth delegates about um, plans and actions that we could put, uh, put in place with our cities. Um, so we also had a session where there were international and local, uh, which was called the International and Local Policies Panel. So it was basically members, um, a part of the United Nations and they were talking about how we can, as youth, how we can engage with the United Nations and how we, um, how we can actually make a change. And one of the, one of the um, organizations that they talked about was Girl Up, and um, I'm a proud president of that club that I've started, and I had the opportunity to talk to her about it. And then um, after the luncheon session, we had an afternoon general session. And um, the afternoon general session was just about housing and urban development. And Ben Carson was, um, he spoke about um, housing and urban development and how we could like help with the housing. And um, another thing during the general session was the broadband uh, deployment and adoption, uh, which was uh, Jessica Rossen Warsaw. She talked about how Many kids, like, they don't have uh, internet access. Uh, they don't have, like, a, uh, internet access in many of their places, so they have to, like, go to libraries and stuff like uh, and other places to get um, broadband. And then after that, we had another session, which was a, a municipal leader n uh, networking, and that session was just talking about uh, reaching out to your city councils and how to talk to them and how 
you can uh, come up with plans and actions. And it was also talking about having better network with other uh, council members and with your uh, youth delegates. And also in March 13th, we also had more workshops to attend. One of them was talking about e equality and equity for the actions of economic op opportunity. And it talks about how in, in the economy that we strive for equality. However, for using equality is not technically the right solution. With the, in the main, eh, sorry. You're good. <laughs> the main uh, point of this workshop was to show that it's that in economy you need to use a more equitable solution, and we had a picture which clearly def demonstrates how this works. But since we can't show you, I'll just demonstrate it, uh, talk about it to you. Where three people, and they're like very, they vary in size. Both have a sm one small box to try to peek through a fence to watch a baseball game. However, because of their varying heights, not all of them can watch it. And this is how equality works. They all have the same one small box. However, that still does not give it a general solution for everybody. With equitability, you, you give the right amount of boxes or, or resources to, for certain people so each can have their own same amount of um, availability. Um, so then after that, we were given the opportunity to attend any workshop we wanted to. And one of the workshops that some of the other youth delegates attended was the Future of Marijuana Policy, Laws and in Industries and Taxes. So um, basically, they were just talking about um, the future of marijuana in cities. And it wasn't exactly enforcing a policy or enforcing their opinion. It was mostly just talking about if and when that happens in their cities, how they would be able to handle it. And Colorado actually came up a lot in that because we are one of the states that actually legalized marijuana. So it was nice seeing how um, other cities would come here and um, see how we are handling our new um, legalization of marijuana and how we've been handling um, the laws and regulations here. And then um, on the same day, um, we had uh, we had another session that was increasing youth engagement in local and federal government. And at um, during that session, uh, we had to come up with an action that we wanted to do, and we came up with voting age. So uh, we wanted like uh, to lower the voting age um, to 16 and. Um, there is a panel uh, that, w that, w that was talking about the pros and cons of that. And there was not a lot of cons. Uh, there were mostly pros. And um, a lot of people were talking about how um, teens have, teens are like, they're mature and they have an intellectual capacity. And uh, uh, lowering the voting age to 16, uh, many youth voices are heard. And uh, it increases youth engagement. Um, to add on to the voting age, the Youth Commission is looking at making um, the voting age another issue for us to tackle um, in the upcoming year. And we, Colorado is one of the legal states that are able to um, lower the voting age to 16 for local elections. Um, so Tacoma Park, which is a city in Maryland, was able to do that recently, and they have lowered the municipal voting age to 16. So. Uh, we are looking forward to working on that with city council and the mayor and making that happen. And then on the last day of the NLC conference, we were able to choose one more uh, conference, I mean, um, session to attend. And I chose to attend the census bureau for the preparing for the 2020 census. And I didn't know much about it, but what I learned is that it's actually really important for the government, but that not much immigrants like answering like the census because it's actually kind of dangerous. It affects them. And we were thinking of bringing it, implying it to Commerce City, but since there's a high, um, high numbers of immigrants, 
that wouldn't be able to, that would be like scared of answering the the census. It would be kind of hard to get the actual numbers. So yeah. So um, on March 13th, um, on the same day, after all the workshops and all the sessions were done, we went to the Capitol and we um, got to uh, go to the House and Senate sessions and we got to see Bernie Sanders. Um, and there were like many statues and like um, we learned about like U.S. history. And then we also went to the Smithsonian National Zoo and the White House and also the National Monument. Um, Hold on very quick. I'll show you some pictures that we took. Mm -hmm. Come on up. We've got these. We have yeah, they're on our packet. They're on the packet. Yeah, we, we can see it. Okay. We can see them. Yeah. <laughs> and so after this, we, we just wanted to talk about the individual impact this, um, this opportunity had on us. So personally, um, it was an amazing opportunity that City Council was able to provide for the Youth Commission, and I was able to see how exactly youth, de youth delegates can raise their voices and talk about um, specific... Uh, issues that they're worried about. For example, I was able to talk in my elevator pitch. I was able to talk about gun violence and gun laws, and um, with other city council members of different uh, of different states and different cities, and that was an amazing opportunity. And I learned more about government and how, um, in the future, I personally can be a government official. I'm looking. Uh, well, in the future, I also want to be on city council, so this gave me an amazing opportunity to be able to see how that works and actually um, interact with other mayors and other city council members from around the country. Oh, and also, uh, the voting age was a, uh, like a prominent issue to me, and um, through this, I was able to see that we actually can lower the municipal voting age for Commerce City because we are one of the states that are able to do so. And I've seen the success rates in um, Tacoma Park and a couple of other cities that have been able to do it. And the youth turnout rate to voting, uh, voting elections has doubled um, since then in 2013 when they did um, enforce this, um, this rule over, the, over lowering the voting age. The NLC trip has shown me and taught me how valuable the infrastructure of a city is. For example, in, with broadband, it is important for students to learn and educate through the, a more modern society of learning. For example, as I, as I see this in my, in my community as well, in MC High School, there are students who are not able to uh, use technology or Wi-Fi to complete their homework as more and more teachers start using these online things such as Google Classroom, Khan Academy, and things like that for them to learn more through online classes. And this becomes very hard for students who don't have that availability. For, for them, now they have to go to other places, stay at the school, go to a library for hours just to complete their homework and not be able to go home until later at night. And this, I can tell, it, it greatly affects Commerce City as well, and I really want to create a change through that. Um, the NLC trip has changed me a lot in many ways. Um, the NLC trip has um, taught me how to interact with other youth delegates and other youth uh, members, and like to express your voices and your opinions. And also, um, the voting age, that was a concern that a lot of... Um, we uh, a lot of youth commissioners had, and uh, we're planning to do that for our next uh, plan, and also just interacting with other youth delegates and like bringing all that information back to Commerce City is um, helping us uh, become better leaders and um, helps other youth uh, members as well, and and also um, uh, listening to other. Um, uh, other members like uh, Ben Carson and Jessica Rawson Warsaw talk about housing and urban development and the broadband deployment and adoption uh, helped a lot uh, learning about the government and how uh, they're, uh, they're implementing other things. And uh, about the broadband deployment, it helped uh, me learn about how a lot of kids don't have uh, access to internet and they go to libraries um, to just uh, 
get access to internet and they don't have the access to internet at home. So a lot of people struggle in uh, Commerce City, um, specifically about broadband. And also, uh, like, in, uh, it helped me increase, uh, increase youth engagement in local and federal government. So it helps like create new plans and actions that uh, other youth delegates could have. So what I got out of um, the NLC trip was that it's actually really important to know about the federal government, not just local, because Cities United can actually make a bigger impact on, well, on the U.S. and its laws. If we come together, it creates more change, and I believe that some cities that, from what I learned of, from other youth delegates, that some cities face the same problems that, and that we should come together to the federal government and create change. So last, we just wanted uh, to thank city council and the mayor for allowing us to visit New York, uh, New York City, sorry, uh, Washington, D.C., and be able to attend this conference because we were able to retain so much information and bring this back to our city and help it further and help uh, youth, youth commissioners as um, like us to further help youth in this city. Thank you. Well, thank you. We uh, appreciate the opportunity um, to have you go and be able to bring back and think of ways to better our community for youth within our community. Um, hopefully it was as life-changing as uh, of a trip as my first trip to Washington, D.C. was. Um, I learned more in the one week in my first trip to D.C. than I learned in all of my American history classes for four years of high school. So it, it uh, has a dramatic impact to see our nation's capital and understand how government works. So thank you for going and uh, seeing that. And, and I want to thank you all for sitting through a long meeting so far uh, because some of the things you were learning is where we have jurisdiction, where we don't. Like on oil and gas, that's a state issue. We have, have uh, surface controls and not anything underground. So it's important to learn about government if you want to get involved with government. You talked about the marijuana policies uh, portion of, of your trip to D.C. I was invited to participate in a uh, call to Canada uh, with 70-some other mayors in Canada I was the only mayor in the United States to talk to them about our policies because they thought Commerce City had set forth some great policies based on zoning and, and other ways that we are uh, managing marijuana in our community. So um, it's important that you learn what's going on nationally as well as in your own community. So I'm glad we got the Youth Commission put back in place and, and now it looks like it's, it's doing really well. Um, but keep doing what you guys are doing. We, uh, we appreciate the impact that we can have on our youth and our community because somebody's going to be the next mayor for Madam City High School. I believe I'm the only one that has ever been a mayor for Commerce City that came out of and graduated from Madam City High School. So keep up the good work. I want to turn it over to any of the council members that have anything they'd like to say. Mr. Douglas. Uh, yes. I want to thank you guys for being here and, and uh, waiting patiently to do your presentation. And thank you for representing Commerce City when we went to Washington. I was able to speak to um, all, all of you. Uh, uh, you know, the age thing came up about voting. And, you know, we, you know, we look at things like that because there are kids, you know, that actually work, they pay their taxes, they drive, they get their license, they be really responsible. Uh, that's, pretty, that's a part of being responsible um, when it comes to voting and in, in, um, also, your civic duty to vote, but not have the ability to do that because of age restrictions. Um, you know, there was a lot of youth that were there from other states, and that's why you guys interact with them, and you guys did very well. Some of you spoke up, some of you didn't. Uh, some of you could sing, some of you could dance. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. But no, I want to appreciate, uh, I, I do want to, want I want to say I do appreciate you guys hanging in there. Also going through on the Youth Commission, it's not just about going to Washington. It's about being effective as a youth and that your voice is heard. 
And believe me, we do hear you, whether it's at the city hall here or at the, or at the school, school district. Uh, I know some kids were on the corner here this afternoon around 4 o'clock um, protesting. I mean, you know, your, your voice is heard. So I do appreciate you guys being here. Anyone else? Seeing none, thank you again. Keep up the good work and uh, just watch the one guy in the back of the room. All right? <laughs> Don't always believe everything he says. All right? Give him a hard time any time you get the chance. All right, thank you. All right, the next presentation is going to be from Tony DeVito on I-70. Tony, good to see you again. Welcome back to Commerce City. Evening, Mayor and uh, members of City Council. Tony DeVito, uh, Project Director for Central 70 with the Department of Transportation. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to come here and uh, chat again about the project. Uh, excited tonight because uh, in the years of going through the NEPA analysis. We've been here numerous times talking about the project, but here with me tonight are members of the Kiewit Meridium team, uh, who is our selected developer to actually uh, bring this project to reality. So uh, after a long, long, uh, arduous time, uh, we can actually uh, get to some brass tacks and talk about some uh, actual design and, and how this thing's gonna be built with the developer on board. So with us, uh, we have numerous members, Tom, Hal with Kiwit, uh, other members uh, probably will introduce themselves as they come up and speak, but uh, if we have any questions, uh, the bench is full tonight. So yeah. um, I know we're having difficulties, so I will kind of run through our PowerPoint. I know you have it in front of you. We do. Um, project location, as you can imagine, uh, this is uh, I-70. Uh, I'm a native from the Mousetrap East, um, and... Um, you know, about 11 miles. This is a, a lifeline for the Denver metro area for the state of Colorado. Uh, this is our through movements for interstate commerce, for movements from uh, DIA uh, to a, a lot of the recreational resorts. This is a lot of our also 1,200 businesses that are some of our largest uh, distribution centers um, that move goods and services to the metro area. And so this is uh, a very critical project. Uh, next slide. Overall, what we're doing here with this $1.2 billion project is adding an, an express lane in each direction um, between um, I-25 out just past 225. In doing that, you can kind of see how um, in the purple area, that's an area that was rebuilt a few years ago that's wide enough to accommodate a restriping to accommodate the express lane. Uh, the blue and orange Bronco colors on your PowerPoint, on, on your uh, handouts there is uh, the lowered section, which is probably the hardest part about the project. From there, from Colorado Boulevard just to about Quebec uh, Street, uh, the 270 interchange is um, a full reconstruction. And then from 270 east to just past 225 to Chambers is a very straightforward widening. Um, the heart of the project and the iconic part, part of the project will be lowering the interstate, removing that viaduct, and reconnecting that community with a four-acre park. Uh, the next slide kind of gives you a depiction of what the current view of the uh, interstate is and the future of what we are going to build. As I can say, that park is not just an idea. That is, the amenities on that park are um, aspects that we have worked uh, very diligently with the community, um, uh, Denver Public Schools, uh, City and Denver uh, Parks, um, Parts of this uh, cover will incorporate uh, school activities. There's an, uh, like an amphitheater. There's a splash park. These are things that we worked hand in hand with the community to come to resolution with um, over the years of the NEPA study. So uh, in a lot of aspects, when we talk about a design build, uh, what you see there on that park is not really up for option. That is what we've committed to, and that is what the Key Whitten Radium team will deliver. And then down below, you can kind of see uh, the um, three general purpose lanes with an added an express lane, but it's built wide enough to accommodate two express lanes in the future, so there's added width there uh, to kind of envision the future needs once we do do this area. 
Uh, the next slide, it kind of just talks about some of the major milestones. You know, we started this environmental study uh, many years ago, um, two, 20, 2003. Many years under development now. I think it's been uh, um, 14, no, 16 years in development. So it's been a long time in development. Um, um, as you can see, in 2014, we finally reached a supplemental draft EIS uh, with the lowered alternative. That was the alternative that finally gained um, enough momentum and consensus. You'll never get everybody in favor of an alternative in the NEPA world. Uh, but as you can kind of see, that's when we started to go out for requests for qualifications. And uh, then uh, the RFI per, uh, for the four shortlisted teams uh, we had four shortlisted teams at the table. Uh, Kiewit Meridian uh, rose to the uh, selected developer. Uh, they had a great proposal, and we'll talk about that. But as you can kind of see, uh, reached commercial close in 2017, financial close in December, and we are ready to start breaking ground here this summer. So it's been a long <coughs> haul, uh, but we are, we are here finally. Um, along with that, as I was saying, that you never get everybody on board uh, 100%. Like as I say, we don't get people doing the way for CDOT projects. There is often uh, opposition to our projects, especially of this magnitude. Um, we have, as you can kind of see on the lawsuit update, uh, we have weathered five legal challenges to date, knock on wood. Um, you know, and, and, and so far our efforts and our diligence that we have put towards this project have prevailed in all um, um, complaints uh, and lawsuits that have been alleged against this project. So I'm happy to say tonight that we feel very confident that breaking ground this summer is imminent. Uh, along with that, this project, um, you know, because of the, the environmental sensitivity of the, of the community impacted many years ago when the interstate alignment was picked, uh, this project has done uh, mitigation that's never been seen in my 27 years with CDOT. One of the things I'm very proud of is how the team has moved forward with the local hire program. Um, local hire is something that really doesn't go hand in hand when we do federal projects. Uh, we were one of nine DOTs that were allowed to do this pilot um, outreach with, uh, with a, a local hire uh, goal. And with that, we opened up a neighborhood training center. We had one of the buildings on the south side of the viaduct that we had acquired uh, was the old Anderson drilling building. We converted that, put about almost $100,000 into that building to make it a viable training center. Um, I'm just very proud of the amount of graduates. We have turned 200 graduates in the evening and uh, nighttime classes through that program. A lot of them from the community, a lot of them. Um, and some of the media has picked up on this. Uh, we have actually had some graduates that um, have seen um, opportunities in the construction industry right now. If you ask any contractor, um, workforce is the, is the issue that binds, hinders them. And so uh, we are out there and we are actually getting them into some construction 101 classes, uh, OSHA training classes, and um, a lot of these classes are in the evenings uh, that cater to them, allowing them to work. Um, and um, along with this, we've also uh, garnered the um, attention of uh, the Piton Foundation, and uh, they have kind of bolstered this now uh, with a Work Now initiative. And um, along with uh, their support, we're able to provide daycare and other amenities that um, are needed for individuals uh, to uh, take, that, take that opportunity to garner another uh, uh, trade. And so uh, with that, we will continue hand-in-hand -hand with uh, the Kiewit Meridian partners in that workforce training. And uh, it's just been such a, a, such a great thing that we've uh, embarked on, and it's working well. And as you can kind of see from the map there, uh, we do go into southern Adams County. We extend out into Aurora um, as part of our um, areas that are identified for the local hire. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tom that will kind of walk through the Kiewit Meridian slides. Oh, Paulo Andre with Meridian. Thank you so much. You Thank you, Tony. Just a brief presentation. My name is Paulo Andre. I'm the project manager for KMP, Kiewit Meridian Partners, and Kiewit Meridian Y. Kiewit is a long-term construction company based not only in Omaha and Nebraska, but for 80 years in Colorado. And Meridian 
being uh, originally a French fund. It's in the U.S. for already uh, more than 10 years, uh, with 16 big projects in North America, 60 uh, worldwide. And this joint venture uh, was successful on bidding for this project. And uh, we are uh, thrilled about this experience in Colorado and in Denver. Um, the, with no doubt, Qt was the right partner, and we found a way to be here today and to present to you this uh, amazing project with a record time in terms of financial closing. So the bankers and uh, not only uh, the private sector of the finance, but also the TFIA federal institution, uh, uh, believed in this project, and uh, this is the kind of uh, insurance that we have. And uh, at these sometimes difficult times on, on the financial world, uh, Denver and Colorado can make a benchmark, one more benchmark on the P3 universe uh, in the United States. So I pass the word to Tom. He will explain to you briefly about uh, your ne our next steps in terms of construction. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name's Tom Howell. I'm the design build project manager for Kiewit on this project. Um, projects like this aren't new to me. I actually showed up here in Colorado in 2000, and I was the project manager on the T-Rex project. So I've got quite a bit of experience working up and down the interstate here in Denver, both on the I-25 job and now, now uh, on the Central 70 project. Talk a little bit about the construction phasing of this project. Uh, as Tony talked a little bit earlier, we've broken the job up into three phases, what we call the West End, the set, which goes from Brighton Boulevard to Colorado. And then we have the center section, which is Colorado to Sand Creek or the two, 270 interchange, and then 270 out to the end. Uh, as Tony said, construction will begin later this summer uh, with groundbreaking, uh, specifically work on the east end. So from 270, the 270 flyover, out to the east. Uh, the 270 flyover, we get a lot of questions about that, and what are we going to do with that ramp? That ramp, as it exists today, remains open. And we build the new 270 ramp that connects eastbound uh, adjacent to it. Once we move traffic onto the new eastbound ramp, then we will remove the old existing ramp as it sits there. Uh, the east end of the project will be complete by the end of 2019, so from Sand Creek out to the east. Uh, we'll then later on this year and early into next year begin the work in the middle section or the center section and on the west end. Uh, center section completes in the late 2020, and then the lowered section was the last piece of work to be complete, and that will be in uh, late spring of 2022. The other question we get a lot is about traffic, specifically uh, in the lowered section. So where the viaduct exists today, traffic will remain on that viaduct for the next two years or so. So as they exist today and there are three, bounds, three, three lanes east and three lanes in the westbound, they'll stay right up there as we build the lowered section for the new westbound lanes. Once that's complete, we'll move both the eastbound and westbound lanes into a temporary configuration in the lowered westbound lanes, tear down the viaduct, and then build the eastbound lanes. And by the end, uh, spring of 2022, we'll then move everybody into final configuration through there. Uh, really, those, that's pretty much what I have on the construction side of it. I guess I just wanted to, you know, you do see a little bit of work ongoing out there. Um, the Colonial Motel has been demoed. Uh, we work closely with CDOT and the Denver Public Schools on getting that down over their spring vacation time. Uh, we're also out there doing soil testing, both for geotechnical information and for environmental information. So we're, we're in full design process right now, and that's what we're getting into, and trying to get segments of the project designed so we can begin this construction later this summer. And then you also see utility relocates going on, specifically on Steel Street right now. Com Comcast is out there, or I'm sorry, CenturyLink is out there right now making a major move that we need to get that line relocated so we can build the new uh, Steel Street viaduct. You know, so right now uh, we are co-located. There's about, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, about 60 to 80 of us. Uh, we're co-located about uh, 47th and Havana. Uh, that is uh, a current location, project office location. It's not our permanent project office location. We are working uh, with Keywood Meridian to actually be closer in proximity to um, the Swansea area community. So where the old uh, pilot truck stop was, uh, Keywood will be rolling in uh, a modular office complex, uh, four large, very large, brand new buildings, and that's where 
uh, for the duration of the, the project. We will be located um, not too far from you guys, so if you have any questions, you know where we're at. Um, you know, we continue to do a lot of outreach, um, and it's, it's great now having the developer on board because as the design, and, and this is the, the beauty of design build, is as the design build packages are being prepared, we are actually getting ready to authorize segments of those to go to cons uh, release for construction. And so when we, when we meet with folks and there's concerns or questions, uh, we are able to actually um, utilize uh, some of the current information. And so um, in, your, in your PowerPoint there, there's a lot of uh, the amount of outreach that we are holding. Um, and then, um, you know, there's some uh, specifics that are identified here with the CenturyLink uh, Steel Street. Uh, that it, this is a, um, a work going on right now with CenturyLink. Uh, there are some activities out there that with early action with utility relocate that you can kind of see right now um, in that area. I know that this is a junk an interchange um, that, that's a concern with you because it's a direct line uh, to uh, Commerce City, but um, Anybody talking about that specific, or uh, you know, as as you can kind of see in the slide, um, it kind of depicts some of the um, the work that CenturyLink is doing right now in that area. But if we have any specific questions of the teams here, we can more than address those. Um, and then uh, that's pretty much it for now. So um, we are here really for the good stuff to answer questions. Great. I appreciate you guys coming in. You bet. Um, there always are uh, concerns, of course. Uh, we are thankful that the 270 alignment didn't happen. Uh, we didn't want that to be to be moved. So we're thankful that the NEPA ended up where it did and it stayed on, on alignment. Um, I think the biggest concerns for me, for Commerce City and our residents, is we don't quite know what to expect for migratory traffic trying to avoid I-70 during construction, except, especially for the amount of years that it's going to be under construction, to migrate through our community to try to find alternative ways to avoid uh, I-70. We already know 270 functions as a parking lot today, so we, we, we know that you can't put any more traffic down it than you've been able to put down it for years. But our local roads, uh, 56th Avenue, 60th Avenue, 72nd Avenue, Rosemary, uh, Quebec, you know, folks that are trying to get from east to west, migrating back to their homes, um, the impact that it's going to have on our local roads and how uh, we can manage that and what you guys anticipate. Because I know the intention is to leave three lanes open each direction through the duration of the project. Um, Good communication to our staff to make sure that if there is going to be any type of closures or, or, or reduction in, in any of that lanage, we're the closest community if they're migrating east to west and anywhere to the north that they will get off and, and try to migrate through past the stadium through where we're at now and, and try to angle across. And we're already, uh, you know, the fastest growing city in Adams County. And we're dealing with uh, impacted roads already, uh, congestion, and we just don't know what to expect and how we reach out and make sure uh, that we're communicating on, on what to expect, when to expect it, and so that we could try to avoid problems before they occur. Okay, so before I hand it off to Hunter, uh, you know, we set the rules of the playing field because obviously for years, uh, in, the, in the development phase of this RFP, we've been here and we've heard that concern. So we have set, as an agency, the rules of the playing field. Um, and, and, and in essence, we are saying that um, you are to maintain as much as possible uh, through the peak periods, interstate uh, travel. Um, Off-peak, you can have some of your closures. Um, and, and we have not set up any of the rules that allow for... Um, uh, the developer or any of the developing teams to utilize other networks uh, for detours. We went down that path. We looked at that, whether it would expedite construction, because everybody does would like to see a more expedited construction. But given the nature of I-70, I-270, and everything in, that, in conjunction along with 225, um, we set those rules, and those are in the contract. Um, 
Kiewit Meridian will talk about that, but I believe, in all honesty, with continued lines of open communication, being sure that we're well coordinated on incident management, um, those are some of the keys of fundamentals, and we'll be back in here through all the phases of construction to be sure that uh, what we anticipated um, and what we're witnessing in reality um, is still open for dialogue um, as we go through this construction phase. So with that, I'll hand it over to Hunter Sindor, who will talk a little bit about uh, the communications and, the, and those plans. Great. Thank you. Hi, I'm Hunter Sidner. I'm the Public Information Manager for KMP, and uh, I decided I had to get up and talk a little, too. Uh, this is clearly something that we've heard a lot from the neighborhoods of Swansea and uh, Liria. You know, what about the cut-through traffic? And we are working really hard on those communication pieces, and um, in some ways we have two different kinds of audiences. We want to encourage the through travelers to stay on I-70, uh, that things will uh, be moving roughly the way that they move today, but with incident management, courtesy patrol trying to keep traffic there so people are not cutting through the neighborhoods. And then there's a little bit of that neighborhood communication that we also have to do because we want to make sure that residents in areas know that their roads are open and they can get to and from their houses. And then, I guess, truthfully, there's three audiences here, too, because you also have those local businesses, and we need to make sure that people understand that the local businesses are open. So it's, it's going to be a communication uh, trick at the end of the day to make sure that we are communicating the right things to the right audiences and using different tools to communicate those things and trying to make sure that people have the information that they need at the time that they need it to help them get around through this area and really uh, as best we can trying to keep people on the highway. Thank you. Does uh, city council members have any questions for CDOT or the Meridian Kiwit team? Uh, Mr. Wardiola. Yeah, I just have a, a one thing. Is there going to be internship uh, opportunities for high school kids, college kids for this whole project for the four years? Or have you guys discussed it with any of the universities or local uh, educational institutions? Uh, that's a great question, Councilman. Uh, we've actually worked with uh, two. We've identified two, and in, in, in it's open to Kiwit Meridian to do actually more. But we did work with uh, Denver Public Schools, um, their career outreach program, and also with the Rupe Jesuit. Uh, were two of the firms that we had identified. Um, you know, it, what we're trying to do is, especially with that local hire, um, if we can incorporate even students into internships, we'll count that towards that uh, local hire. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff that we've learned is that, um, you know, if you can start with that generation of getting them into a career, um, you know, and getting them into a path towards college, a lot of times uh, in these economic communities, the, uh, they get out of high school and they have the earning capabilities that the family is like, we need you to work and not go to college. And if we can continue that path to college, uh, we're, all, we're all on board. So um, if, you, if there are things that we've missed with other uh, schools, we're, we're all ears. Who would be the contact for that? You know, um, Hunter, myself, and another, my, one of my deputies on the project, Rebecca White, has uh, been really uh, coordinating a lot of that on the project. All right, Mr. Douglas. Yes, thank you. You guys for being here and taking questions. And uh, very interesting. Um, also serve on the E470 board. And um, with this project here being uh, collecting tolls and everything, uh, is there any plans when this is all said and done that you're going to help uh, joining cities with roads that lead up to I-70 to work on future expansions and widening of our area, because when you when you go through 270, traveling north. Uh, no, I'm sorry, coming from uh, from the north to the south, and you as you enter on on to 270, um, you have a short run to get on to 270. I mean, they're short. They might as well be city city uh, entrance to the highway because there's the length of those are not very long at all. But you have a lot of traffic trying to merge on to 270 in a short distance. Same thing at York. So with that, um, is there any future plans that helping cities 
expand those roads without having an impact uh, to our budget and not making it where we have to go through the same type of thing uh, to, to make it a toll and all that because that's a whole long drawn out thing. Um, because we're, we want to help to make sure you guys are successful, but then again, we want to make sure you, in return you help us out to help mitigate because our roads aren't, our, our traffic's not going to get any better. Once you guys have this up, that's not going to help us out. And we're going to be hit hard for the next four years or maybe longer than that. So those are the things I want to uh, have answers to, I mean, hear from you guys. And I know you don't have all the answers right now, but just something for you guys to take back with your team and look at what's the future of, of all these different routes that lead um, outside uh, from I-70 into I-70. You know, Councilman, that's a great point. And as um, the population influx, influx continues to grow in the metro area, um, we, we, we continue to see um, how, how far behind we are. And um, this express lane project, along with I-25 North, I-25 South, what we've done on US-36, it, it ultimately will be part of a network. And I know um, I work very closely with the high-performance high transportation enterprise right now, and that HPTE has um, a consultant on board to look at a managed lane um, ultimate plan uh, study that they, they're looking at prioritizing kind of our future of our express lanes. I know that doesn't answer all your questions, um, but from a DOT standpoint, we are trying to identify, you know, what is the future of connectivity for express lanes? And that probably does include 270, um, includes direct connects hopefully to 270, 225. Uh, those are the things that will make ultimately this project and other projects work um, a little more seamlessly. Um, you know, we know as interstates fail, I've seen this all through my career, as interstates fail, the local roads um, become um, the collector of, uh, of that traffic. And so um, our number one goal is to get these uh, roads to be reliable. We know that express lanes uh, do provide reliability. We've seen it on US 36, we've seen it on I-25, the Mountain Express. Um, that is why we continue to go that path because um, express lanes um, are bringing relief, um, but ultimately um, they need to be able to connect and, and there, there are future needs. 270 has its own needs. Um, and in my days as old Region 1 director, we've had numerous discussions about what, what the future of 270 is. And so um, as we go along, we're always um, open to communities to understand what the local collector system uh, can accommodate, uh, what are the priority routes. Um, City and County of Denver has identified certain routes as truck routes. Um, I, I know we can continue to work hand in hand with Denver and Commerce City, Adams County, and, and continue to identify what are those priority routings. Um, you know, it, it comes down to this dialogue and being sure that we're all coordinated. Because mm -hmm. I know that they're, uh, right now, you know, in the House, they're trying to get these bills through there, or at least be heard. And one of them has to do with future managed lanes and tolling. And that if, if we say if that passes, there won't be the ability to have that type of uh, uh, revenue generating um, projects. Mm -hmm. Now, it, that won't affect I-70, but it will, for, you know, that will hurt other projects going forward if that's passed. You know, if it all fits into a, a, a grander scheme of, a, you know, what, what, a, what, a, what a network actually connects to and can go from express lane network to express lane network, uh, that is all for the better. Um, we'll have to see how that legislation plan pans out. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions from council? I want to uh, thank you and your team. Um, just want to make sure that we have access to you when need be, and I know I do, Tony. I can reach out to you anytime. You bet. Um, but we're just still kind of in that mode of not knowing what to expect. And so with the amount of trains and all of the highways that we have in Commerce City and the Platte River where it's at, um, we're limited on east-west connections. And so with I-70 being uh, a large east-west connection to our south, worried about that migration traffic that tries to come through and clog up our local collectors, but we'll work through it as it happens. And I know I can sit here all day long and tell you how bad 
270 needs to have improvements. I'm not going to do that to you tonight because we work through the COG and, and we're trying to get those projects. I don't know if the state's going to get additional uh, funding um, through the legislature this year or not, but we're really suffering in the state of Colorado for transportation financing. And we've been supportive of transportation financing. So um, hopefully we could see some light at the end of the tunnel, um, but really concerned about the next four years with the I-70 project. And you, you may hear from some of us on occasion, we really want to be a team player and, and work with you guys to, to help you get your project done and not be too much of a burden, but we also have to be responsive to our residents. So I appreciate you guys coming in today. You're welcome back here for updates anytime. Thank you. Likewise, appreciate always the support of the years and uh, commitment to always open lines of communication as we uh, uh, bring this project to reality. Right. Thank you all. Have a good Thank night. You. Good night. Okay. Next on deck, Brian McBroom with the quarter one work plan update. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, not having the projector tonight is very disappointing. We had just a fantastic multi-visual presentation for you tonight, uh, so you'll get the simplified version of it. Uh, this is our first quarterly update for 2018. We were before City Council on February 5th providing a quarterly update. That was an update of the fourth quarter of 2017, so it included a lot of year-end information for 2017. So tonight is our first update on the 2018 work plan. As a reminder, work on the 2018 work plan began in very early 2017. It started really with City Council's planning retreat, which in 2017 was the end of January. So a lot of the work that you'll see or that we're reporting on tonight is priority work that was set um, in 2017 and got incorporated in the adoption of the 2017 budget. In February of 2018, City Council reviewed the 2018 work plan, provided us some additional feedback, some additional priorities. So this, for the first time, you'll, you will see, uh, if you've looked through the presentation, how we've operationalized uh, the priorities identified in 2017, but we've also uh, operationalized the additional priority work that City Council uh, set forth at the retreat at the end of February. So it's, uh, it's an important night for us to demonstrate to the community and to City Council the value of the work we do every day. But it's also an assessment tool. It's an opportunity for us, though it's early in the year, uh, to see how we're doing. Um, as such, the goal, and I, I share this with staff quite frequently, the goal in the work plan is not to have it all green. We want to show accurately where we are with completing the commitments that we've made uh, but the work plan is also a way for us to make adjustments. Priorities do shift throughout the year. Uh, other factors impact our ability to accomplish priority work. So it's important for us to constantly be assessing where we are, where if we're not where we thought we would be, what adjustments do we need to make uh, to get things back on track. You will see in the information uh, two terms that are worth talking about a little bit. We, uh, we show if things are on track, that will show as green. If there is some disruption, it shows as yellow, and some disruption means that we've experienced some minor roadblocks that may jeopardize the project's timeline or that may represent a change in the project plan. So yellow means there may be some disruption. We may not uh, accomplish the project according to the timeline that we've laid out. Major disruption, on the other hand, means we've, uh, we've accomplished some major roadblocks. So even though it's early in the year, if we're showing something is red, we're quite certain we're not going to meet the timeline that we set out. So you'll also see in the detail, what are we doing about that? Is it because it's a priority that's shifting or is it off track for other reasons and we need to get it back on track? So that's a, that's a quick update. It's also uh, what I like about the work plan, it's a key alignment tool. We talk a lot about being in alignment with city council. City council sets the direction for this organization you set out in a big picture standpoint the important what's, and it's our job uh, to turn that into action. So I hope that the work plan demonstrates for you how we're again operationalizing city council's priorities and turning that into action 
but as always, it's uh, also about making adjustments throughout the year. So with that introduction, I'll turn it over to Troy to walk through uh, more details. Thank you, Mr. McBroom. Uh, good evening, Mayor and members of Council. I'm going to start tonight with um, uh, slide number five, uh, given Mr. McBroom's remarks. Slide number five uh, introduces Council's additional priorities for 2018. These are the things um, that Mr. McBroom mentioned that the City Council asked to add to the 2018 work plan when we had our annual retreat earlier this year. Uh, to look at uh, the options for paving 112, the sit-down restaurant and amenities, increasing the availability of social human services in the core city, the Mile High Greenhound Park redevelopment update, uh, consider purchasing land for ball fields and sports complex, evaluating additional traffic signal installation, uh, reviewing City Council's goals, and an updated pavement maintenance plan now, while I won't uh, cover all those areas of revision in detail tonight, I have included the slides that were put together for City Council's study session at the end of this presentation for your reference. Uh, and those details are available for you to look at. Uh, the next slide um, is simply a reminder that our plan is a, our work plan is a five-level plan starting at the top with City Council goals. And at the very bottom are tactics, which are individual work items that we do throughout the course of the year. Um, through the first quarter of 2018, our plan is at the city council goal level is 91% on track. And that percentage rolls up from every tactic in the report. There are a total of 809 tactics. So while it shows 91% on track, there are certain outcome areas that are certainly more disrupted than that. And if you look at the executive report, which is attached, there's very clear indication at each outcome level what level of on-track or disruption uh, exists, as Mr. McBroom pointed out. Council goal number one is 100% on track. Um, there are two outcome areas, eight objectives, 22 strategies, and 52 tactics associated with council goal number one and some highlights of work done and completed in the first quarter um, include the achievement of a multi-year initiative created originally in January of 2017 um, to increase the flex space associated with both commercial and industrial spaces by 4%. And within five quarters, um, that work has been uh, completed and we did achieve that 4%. In fact, you can see uh, flex space, in particular flex industrial space, increased by 18.96%, warehouse by 11.26%, um, and retail by 6.79%. Uh, work will continue in our economic development department in this area uh, through the remainder of the year, but we will be rewriting a new objective to cover the remaining three quarters uh, of this year. The Irondale Neighborhood Plan um, is on track and is, as Brian pointed out, sometimes things are disrupted and we only change uh, those project plans, including the date on an annual basis. So the original completion date for the Irondale Neighborhood Study was uh, originally be December 31st of 2017. Uh, we did not achieve that. That was read at the end of the year, as you recall. We reset the clock, set a new completion date for July of 2018 for that project. Um, we have draft goals that will be presented to the City Council on, at the study session on May 14th, and the next neighborhood meeting relative to that project is scheduled on May 16th. It is on track for completion uh, at its new completion date, which is July of this year. The station area was classified as an opportunity zone uh, during the first quarter of this year, which is good news for a potential investment through in that corridor. corridor. Uh, moving on still on council goal number one, um, this is one of the new objectives as a result of city council's priority, but to secure a commitment by December 31st of this year for a national or Colorado based sit down restaurant chain located in Commerce City. And as a result of that direction, we have retained retail coach uh, to collect new data and there'll be a report coming to city council in July at a study session and we have developed a targeted list of 250 com companies that represent 
28 restaurant brands, um, and though 28 of those restaurant brands were contacted in the first quarter uh, following up on that priority list. Staff met with nine existing companies in the community as part of their retention program, and we had 150 plus attendees at the Commerce City Appreciation uh, Business Appreciation Breakfast. Moving on to council goal number two. Uh, council goal number two is 95% on track. There are 20 objectives, 66 strategies, and 272 tactics in support of this council goal. About 5% of them are experiencing some disruption. Uh, we hosted a successful job fair at Buffalo Run Golf Course during the first quarter, and that really targeted hiring for um, our new facilities and facility expansion. Um, we conducted training in those classes uh, for professional development for employees across the city. Our vacancy rate through the first quarter was 9.9% across the organization. HR and the police department implemented new police officer recruitment processes and guidelines. Our experienced modification rating um, is under 1 at 0.9%. And our SIRSA audit was completed in the first quarter and we saw a significant improvement in our audit score as a result of the diligent work of our risk management office. Uh, this year we scored a 114 out of 120 possible points. Technology infrastructure availability was 99.93% during the quarter, which exceeds our goal of 99%. Uh, Windows 10 was beta tested. IT closed 1,249 incidents or service requests through the service desk. Information technology department established formal written guidelines for service levels for each city department. Each department is very different and unique in the needs they have from our IT department. And now each department has its own written standard about what they can expect as a response from our IT department. Um, staff coordinated two marijuana licensing, four liquor licensing public hearings, and the clerk's office received three liquor license applications and two marijuana uh, applications during the quarter. Let's see. Um, I think it was uh, Councilman Frank who requested to know um, what specific technology systems would it be evaluated in 2018. Um, for all of your benefit, the list of the system being identified by IT and being reviewed are contained in the quarterly report on page 11. Uh, we have collected uh, over $500,000 in tax revenue, conducted 12 tax audits, uh, eight tax code educational sessions, and this is um, something new for us in the past. We were doing about one of those a year. And uh, this year, our tax divisions really made an effort to go out and meet with businesses directly and provide these educational or training sessions about our tax code with businesses in the community on an ongoing basis. Uh, we approved five sole source contracts in the first quarter, and that represented about 0.04% of the general fund expenditures that occurred during the first quarter. And uh, staff processed approximately 400 business licenses during the first quarter. And just to note, uh, more details in the report if you, if you are interested. But that service level is disrupted. Um, there is a 14-day requirement uh, for turnaround on those, and we currently are not meeting that service level. Council goal number three is 81% on track. Uh, Five outcomes, 32 objectives, 103 strategies, and 257 tactics in support of council goal number three. Uh, City Council finalized the agreement terms with School District 14 related to the Mile High Greyhound Park and the URA. Uh, conducted 2,225 C3 residential inspections. Um, that's about 17% of all the residential units in our city. And the compliance rate achieved was 97%, uh, which is significant. Initiated 832 code enforcement cases. The voluntary compliance rate after the first inspection and issuance of the courtesy notice was 47%. The goal there is 40%. So again, uh, getting good compliance uh, on our enforcement efforts out of 
out of our neighborhood services division. We removed eight tons of debris from the city's storm sewer system and, and drainage systems during the first quarter. There were 129 right-of-way permits all issued within the two-day requirement. 873 utility locations were marked within two business days, and those are for city-owned utilities. Um, we treated 21,067 lane miles of road with 1,110 tons of de-icer during 12, uh, the slide says snowstorms. Uh, really, that's any time when road treatment is necessary. They may not necessarily equate in our minds to a snowstorm. Uh, with respect to the station area, an appraisal uh, for major land acquisition on the north side of 77, 72nd Avenue was completed. The valuation came in much higher than anticipated, and we have learned that the tenant of the property is opposed to the station area project. We also have received 90% complete design plans for the station area improvements. Um, the estimated construction costs of those improvements currently exceeds the available budget by 900000 The staff is working to uh, evaluate the scope of that project. Any changes to scope in that project will be coming forward to City Council for authorization for additional design funds to reduce the scope of that project to bring it into alignment with its budget. Uh, discussions with Adams County about de-annexing Brighton Road have been scheduled for the second quarter, and the 120th and Highway 85 interchange project was identified as one of the top three transportation projects by both uh, the city and by Adams County. Uh, city Council reviewed potential new traffic signal locations as a result of their request to install five new signals. During that presentation, uh, City Council was informed that because of the design requirements and the lead time needed for construction, uh, installation was not likely to occur until the beginning of 2019. The Police Department uh, conducted 4,340 traffic stops, issued 1,774 warnings, and 2,229 tickets were issued. Our fleet availability was at 97 percent 0.6% during the first quarter. The goal there is at 90%, so we're well exceeding uh, our, our goal in that area. Uh, since this presentation was put together, I've learned one of those six accidents was actually in April, which means it was the second quarter, so there were really only five. The slide says there were six, uh, but there were five vehicles involved, city-owned vehicles involved in a crash during the first quarter of 2018. Um, three of the six, so three of the five, um, were uh, the city driver was at fault. 112th Avenue paving, uh, the city council directed staff to proceed with conducting maintenance operations on the road in an effort to open it as a gravel road and to continue to pursue partnerships to design the roadway in its final and paved configuration. I can tell you that as of today, the roadway has been graded up to the area um, where we are waiting on a response uh, prior to filling in uh, that low spot in the road where the water is gathered. Uh, road stabilizer material was applied to the section of East 112th Avenue from where the pavement ends by the golf course out to Parkside Drive. And as a result of the amount of traffic utilizing that road, that is an application that we continue intend to continue for uh, on a three-month rotational basis. Staff received 13 emergency requests to repair potholes. Uh, all of those were repaired within the 24 to 48 hour um, time frame. The city announced the grand opening of the Bison Ridge Rec Center. You'll hear about more about that um, during our um, capital projects update, but all of our capital projects at this juncture are on time and on budget. Uh, our walkability score is currently at 45. The goal is 42. Uh, we performed 6,608 building permit inspections. Um, 
95% performed on the same or next business day, and that's the standard uh, we articulate for service level. There are 78 active development cases in progress and 32 development cases which have already been approved in 2018. Volume is quite higher than it was last year in that regard. The three-week turnaround time for development review cases is trending closer to six weeks, so here's part of our disruption. We're not meeting our service level right now with respect uh, to development review, and that's largely because of the increased volume I just articulated. Uh, as a result of some of the additional priorities that we are focused on, the Historic Preservation Ordinance, which was originally scheduled to be completed in 2018, has been moved uh, to 2019. The art dedications for the Bison Ridge Recreation Center are scheduled for June 7th, 2018. I should note the numbers I gave you for development review uh, were from our community development department. <coughs> there is a part of that process that also lives in public works where there is a review that takes place there and that review is also not meeting its stated service level. Council goal number four is 89% on track, uh, three outcomes, 13 objectives, 32 strategies, and 79 tactics in support of council goal number four. Uh, each patrol officer has been assigned to identify a community-based policing project. Um, we have initiated a project to replace the tax software system. Six Department of Justice technical assistance team site visits and those six were for a week long, so the DOJ has been here for six weeks out of the year in the first quarter, and that's a tremendous uh, a drain on our staffing and resources in the PD uh, when those folks are here in town assisting with technical assistance. The police department issued 35 training notices to its employees, and they conducted their customer survey, which is not the community survey, but a localized police department survey done by supervisors in the police department and that uh, completion rate is disrupted about 64 percent is the completion of what they had intended to be doing at this time however of those surveys that were conducted 97 percent of respondents um, have indicated they received good or excellent service from the police department the summer recreation guide was completed during the first quarter and construction was initiated at the Eagle Point Recreation Center. Um, program and other facility closures have really been scheduled uh, out in order to lessen the impact on patrons uh, until such time the outdoor pool in Bison Ridge is open. So those will start coming more regularly. In the second quarter, we'll see more uh, closures and disruptions to uh, programs and services at that facility. Total Recreation Center attendance, um, that's both drop-in and membership usage dropped, 11.4%. Um, that is largely as a result of the construction initiated um, at uh, Eagle Point. Revenue at the golf course, um, restaurant at Bison Ridge Grill was 8% higher than budgeted. And... Revenue in the golf merchandise sale was 22% higher than budget. And revenue for rounds of golf was 10% lower than budgeted. Um, we have Parks and Recreation has hired a consultant to map and inventory all baseball and softball game complexes and athletic fields within a 50-mile radius of our community uh, to inform the design, the location, the size, and the needs of a city facility, and that's a direct response to your request for additional information relative to constructing a facility like that in our community. Uh, the ULI panel visit was completed for the Healthy Places grant, um, and again, another localized departmental survey conducted at the Recreation Center. 100% of the respondents rated the PRG facility as good or excellent, and 83% indicated they would recommend PRG facilities to a friend. Finally, uh, council goal number five is 99% on track. There are two outcome areas, 18 objectives, 46 strategies, and bless you, 149 
tactics. 34,000 plus visitors uh, visited the agenda minutes webpage. That's a 60% increase from Q1 in 2017. We launched a new parks, recreation, and golf website during the first quarter, and Route 62 ridership increased about 42%. Uh, that's about 17 boardings per hour, and as I understand it, that's still below RTD's threshold for acceptable ridership, which is at 18 boardings per hour. So big number on the percentage increase, but there's a little bit more to the story for you in terms of what that means. Facebook followers increased by 6.6%, 6 .6%, Twitter went up 42 and Nextdoor up 9.3%. And our city clerk's office tracked 86 public records requests in the first quarter. They also processed 42 boards and commissions applications. Uh, social media is trending as our fourth most popular tool for residents to receive information. We did 68 posts with 89% of those posts reaching more than 650 people. Uh, the Irondale neighborhood meeting had about 55 attendees, so a well attended meeting. Six members of the Youth Commission, which you heard about this evening, attended the NLC conference. The telephone town hall held in the first quarter had 321 participants. That's a 36% increase over the Q4. 2017 call and the clerk's office processed 666 passport applications uh, Q1 2017 we did 747 passports so that's 11 percent reduction um, and there was an audit conducted by the Department of State that confirmed compliance with federal standards related to the issuance of passports City Council will hold a study session on May 14th to identify existing human and social services resources, review, gap analysis, and prioritize resource needs. The quarter one executive report is included in tonight's City Council packet, which contains much more detailed information than what's provided in the slide for your reference. Um, and it will be uploaded to the city's web page on the work plan under City Council later this week for review by members of the community. Be happy to attempt to answer any questions about the quarter one uh, work plan report if you have any. Does anybody have any questions on council for uh, Troy on the quarter one work plan? Just Mr. Uh, Teeter. Just curious, I see we're number three on 120th and highway. 85. Do you know what the first two were? Adams County's. Uh... That's okay. I, I can follow up and get you that information. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. I'm sure I'll find out what those are. Okay. <laughs> All right. Anyone else? Mr. Douglas. Thank you. Um, Troy, thank you for your presentation. You said that um, over by uh, 72nd. Um, would you say about the land, about the tenants over there opposing? So there was a, an appraisal that was completed during the first quarter for a piece mm -hmm. of property that's related to the widening of 72nd okay. Avenue. And that appraisal came in with a valuation much higher than, than was anticipated by the project. And at the time the appraisal was conducted, mm -hmm. um, we learned that the tenant of the property is not supportive of the of the stationary improvements the road widening okay. generally all right thank you yes anyone else saying none thank you thank you all right next we're going to uh have an update from uh kip -Kak. good evening you saved the best for last yes, is everybody yeah. awake over there Yep. This, i got to make a couple of comments. First of all, this has been a marathon session. I usually don't sit through this whole thing. and um, But it's been extremely educational. What I learned tonight has really opened my eyes to some things that are going on here that I wasn't aware of. So thank you very much. Uh, council, if you can do it, I can do it. If we have to go this late, then we do. 
just remember, I'm older than you are. Put me higher up on the agenda next time. Okay, uh, good evening. My name is Susan Carbajal, and I am co-chair of the Capital Improvement Program Citizens Advisory Committee, known as KitKat. Our mission is to advise the city and inform and engage the community in capital improvement projects. Okay, the last quarter has flown by again with projects just flying off the shelves getting done. We've seen the widening of Highway 2 completed. Uh, the Eagle Point Recreation Center renovation is underway. The grand opening for the Bison Ridge Rec Center is set for May 25th. I, I'm so excited. Uh, these recreation center projects are becoming a reality, which as um, I'm really you know, stoked on this, and I, you, the community is too. That Bison Ridge is going to be such a wonderful addition. Um, Commerce City used the input from the community and advisory committees to implement design and programming elements and select the new names. The projects continue to move along, and um, we don't have a slide presentation but I, I do have some comments after I introduce um, once more Director of Program Management, Scott, to discuss the capital projects. There you go. Great. Thank you very much, Susan. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, members of City Council. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide an update on what is tonight the 17th quarterly installment since the inception of the Measure 2K program. And uh, as Susan mentioned, since we don't have slides available, we do have 15 slides for anybody who may be watching online this evening. So I'm going to start on slide 3 of 15 and uh, go through the slides uh, that we have for you. Uh, just quickly on the 2K background, for those of you who may be watching uh, from home. Uh, this was uh, Measure 2K approved by the voters in November of 2013. It committed to five projects in five years. The program goals and objectives related to building high quality facilities to lower long term operation costs, spend taxpayer dollars wisely and transparently, and complete projects on time. On slide four, uh, there's a summary of the 2K tax revenue. Again, this was a 1%. Uh, basis point increase in the sales and use tax for the city uh, that occurs in perpetuity. And uh, the current forecast for the year is $2.2 .2 million have been received through the month of February. We have a bit of a lag uh, out of an expected $12.4 million over the course of the year, so slightly ahead of schedule at this point. Uh, on slide five, uh, you'll just see a rendering of the 2K executive summary uh, that's produced monthly. It's incorporated in the city manager's report and includes all aspects of the scope, the cost, and the schedule for the various projects. Uh, on slide six, uh, current status of the five projects in five years. Uh, we are on the cusp of accepting final delivery of the new recreation center. Bison Ridge, which is going to leave us with essentially one of the five projects remaining through the balance of the year, and that's the Eagle Point Recreation Center. Uh, slide seven is simply a rendition of what this where this program stands uh, on a percent complete basis. Uh, the program currently stands at 85 percent complete with 15% remaining through the balance of the year, and that will be for the uh, final closeout of the uh, recreation center, final closeout of Highway 2 invoicing, and the, recreation, the uh, Eagle Point Recreation Center. Uh, on slide eight, we're going to cover just some of the uh, highlights. So in Q1 of 2018, I know we're in May now, so we're a little bit beyond Q1, uh, but we did issue the Eagle Point final guaranteed maximum price. That came before this body in February of 2018. On slide nine, uh, we talk about the continued Bison Ridge Recreation Center construction. Uh, we have achieved substantial completion of that project now, so that's very exciting, and grand opening is forthcoming. Uh, in uh, 
Q1 also for the Eagle Point uh, project, the therapy pool, foundation, and walls work uh, was underway. On slide 11, the renovation kickoff event occurred and uh, stimulated some interest and excitement in the community for this project. On the CIP project slide, side, on slide 12, uh, final construction activities uh, are, were underway on <coughs> Highway 2. Uh, the project did achieve substantial completion in April. Uh, you will see a few barrels and cones still out there, and uh, otherwise all of the lanes are open, save for some road closures related to the final landscaping that's going along in that corridor. On slide 13, uh, Tower Pena ramp, uh, traffic was rerouted and the widening of the northbound Tower Road lanes uh, began on that project. Uh, that project is slated for completion by the end of the year and based on the progress being made by the contractor, we're hoping to deliver that project even sooner than that. On slide 14, as we look ahead, uh, the Eagle Point internal works is really going to commence and that includes the recreation center locker room pool and fitness area and renovations and of course the grand opening for the bison ridge recreation center will be on friday evening right before memorial day on may 25th uh, as we look ahead on the cip work for uh, the second quarter of this year, this is on slide 15, uh, we're planning on completing and wrapping up the Highway 2 construction, and we're going to be continuing the Tower Road uh, and Pena Ramp construction. Uh, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to hand it back over to Susan to actually show yeah, the video. No, no, I'll bring you back up. We don't have a video for you tonight because of the technology challenges, uh, but if there's any other questions that I can address, I'd be happy to do so now. Does anybody have any questions for Mr. Hergenrader at this time? Seeing none, thank you for your uh, presentation. Thank you. thank you, and let me bring Susan back up for her closing remarks. Thank you. Just, yeah, just some closing remarks real quick. Um, four of the five projects promised to the voters for 2013 have been completed. In 2018, we are looking forward to seeing the final ballot 2K project, Eagle Point Recreation Center expansion, completed by the end of the year. Um, we've done so much, and, and, and our five years is almost up. So um, I just, on behalf of Kit Kat, I wanted to let you know that we are excited to continue working with Council. Um, it was great meeting with all of you in a study session earlier uh, this m couple of months, a month ago, when we were able to give you our input on what we see as fu future work to make Commerce City a real city of the future. Thank you, Council, for all of your hard work and for everything you do for us. And I hope everybody appreciates it because we certainly do. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Okay. Next, we move into administrative council business. We start with uh, a letter for Senator Gardner per request. Will uh, Michelle Halstead please come forward and present the letter request? You think I'm loud enough? Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, members of council. So in your packet today, this is a follow-up to our federal advocacy trip um, from D.C. If you recall, we met with Senator Gardner, and one of the things he talked about was advancing funding for uh, park uh, deferred maintenance. This letter um, not only indicates our city's support for that, but also requests that they um, seek an amendment to really look at refuge maintenance. That was a key issue, and certainly with the Rocky Mountain Arsenal National Wildlife Refuge in our backyard, we have a lot of deferred maintenance, and the letter highlights one of those key projects around the lakes that would help improve access um, and accessibility issues. So um, we also have noted the staffing concerns that may need some additional support in the future. So um, because we're asking this letter to be signed by the mayor, we're asking you all to support and endorse that tonight. Need a consensus? Is there a motion? Mr. Hughesman? 
motion that we approve the mayor signing the letter to the Honorable Senator Corner Gardner in regard to the National Park Restoration Act. Thank you. Mr. Douglas. Second. I have a motion to second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion is carried. Thank you. Aye. All right. Now we need to talk about <coughs> council appointment to the senior commission. Is there anyone on council that is able to serve on the senior commission as the second council member? When did they meet? 3 p.m. at the Civic Center. Right. Every On the second Thursday of every month at 3 p.m. here. Anybody? Second Thursday. Huh? You want it? Sure. Mr. Huseman. Uh, is volunteering. Understanding that I will miss some meetings. Yeah, so uh, I'm open <laughs> for a motion to approve uh, Councilmember Huseman to serve on the Senior Commission. So Mr. Teeter? I'll make a motion to have Councilman Huseman um, be appointed to the Senior Commission. Is there a second? Uh, Mr. Wardiola? A second. All right, I have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Nay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I, I really Motion am, is carried. I really am starting to enjoy that. We are uh, having a good time with there. A bunch of good people. All right. Does anybody else have any business? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, as we're looking at the city council work schedule, we do have a city council meeting scheduled for July 2nd. And I was remembering that we ended up canceling the regular city council meeting for July 3rd last year. I think it was because we had a number of council members who weren't gonna be able to attend the meeting that night. Uh, my memory's a little fuzzy. It might have just been a desire to not have a meeting that night and shift <laughs> some council business around. I wanted to bring it up tonight to see if there was going to be any issue with a quorum that night, we're starting to schedule items you'll see on the work schedule for July 2nd. Uh, so the key question is um, to make sure we will have a quorum that night. Anybody have any plans on not being here July 2nd? Mr. Wardiola, anybody else? <clears throat> Looks like we'll have a quorum, so I'd continue right. with, the, uh, with the meeting. Thank you. Any uh, one on council have any council? Of course you do, Mr. Douglas. Go right ahead. Thank you. <coughs> uh, I had a question for staff. Um, the new rec center, Bison Ridge, is that going to be open on Memorial Day? Looks like it is not open. I, I don't believe Eco Point is either. Okay. Um, is there a way, I know we're doing the presentation, I mean, the celebration on the Friday, and it's open for free on Saturday, right? Correct? Sure. So it's going to be free on Friday from 5 to 9, and then Saturday it opens for regular service. So okay. you would be taking advantage of, you know, drop-in activities, et cetera. You would be paying for those fees. And then Sunday, it's open for regular service. Monday, everything um, except the pool is, is um, closed, and then it continues on. Um, is there any way that we can propose to uh, have a free weekend for Saturday and Sunday, only because the rec center down here is going to be closed just to attract more commerce and residents to um, partake in the event for that weekend. Certainly. Um, do, you, do you have a weekend in mind? I, I, I might suggest we do some quick analysis of uh, what it might cost in, uh, in terms of revenue. We mm -hmm. probably would want to put some extra staff on as well in case it drew larger than normal attendance on those days. Did you have an idea in mind of when you would want to do that? 26th and 27th of May. Oh, you're speaking <laughs> of that, that weekend. Yeah. I'm sorry, I missed that part. So that Saturday and that well, Sunday. I mean, if I can, be open. Um, as much as I'd like to make that a free weekend, 
-hmm. With that being the opening weekend and the amount of residents I think that you'll have wanting to come in and sign up and Oh, yeah, they go, can still sign up. Well, sure they can, but <laughs> here's the problem. You will overwhelm the staff at that facility, I think, if you say it's free plus the amount of people that now are going to want to go in and get rec center cards. So my only concern would be could staff handle the kind of, of flows of people on that weekend? Otherwise, I'm all for it, but yeah. I don't know. I don't well, wanna, I'm just saying it means I don't, don't want to over-impact staff on opening yeah, I weekend. I, I wouldn't recommend it on the opening weekend. We are still trying to sort of stand the facility up and have active use for the first time. The concept of some free days later in the year I think is a good idea. I, I see it with uh, uh, facilities in Denver quite regularly. Uh, so that's certainly something uh, – we could we could bring back to you as 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 an idea later in the year to encourage people who haven't tried the facility to come out and try it. Okay. No, I appreciate that. I mean, I just threw it out there, and I didn't know what kind of feedback we can get. Um, the other item um, is uh, the boards and commissions that we have citizens sit on. Um, I know the ones that I sit on. Um, some of the council members that we have citizens there. We, you know, we provide live snack like sandwiches or pizza or something, right? We make sure that all the other, you know, any boards commissions that citizens sit on that their their <coughs> evening evening or afternoon um, meetings, they get some sort of snack or something because that's kind of hard for citizens to come there at that time, and then some of the meetings are kind of lengthy and then have to sit there and. As far as I know, there's no formal policy about providing food or beverages at other board and commission meetings. It's kind of been left up to those boards and commissions and the staff that support them. Mm -hmm. uh, I've not been aware that that's an issue. Have you received feedback from other board and commission members that that's a challenge yeah. for them coming straight from work and mm -hmm. having to sit on a commission maybe meets Right. Well, like the Early. Culture Council, that has a lot of uh, uh, citizens on it and Quality Community Foundation. Um, well, there's also Planning Commission, Board of Adjustment, Derby Review Board. I think how many? There's 11 or 13 boards and commissions. It's uh, Again, there's, there's no uh, rhyme or reason. I think it's sort of evolved mm -hmm. uh, depending on the nature of those boards and commissions. I'm not aware that it's an issue for those that mm -hmm. don't feed members uh, but then again those that do i'm not sure why we necessarily do that uh, in the case of city council the challenge has been folks with um, full-time jobs coming straight from work serving and then the meetings can sometimes run late into the evening yeah and i think that's that's where that evolved from uh, we could certainly survey those boards and commissions and see if okay. it's an issue because i'm gonna me and uh uh, Councilman Elliott on, on the Parks and Rec. So of course, you know we're there. It's you know you usually have sandwiches. Mm. Um, all depends on the length of the meeting. You know they're going to be a couple hours. I think we should uh, provide that to our citizens. We ask them to to serve, and I think you know ability to have offer something to them. I mean we're not talking about a full meal or anything, but you know just like a like I said sandwiches or pizza or something. You have to it has to be a full course. But that at least shows some appreciation for them serving on these boards. Well, I don't think food is necessarily provided as a means of appreciation. It was more to uh, meet, a, meet a need given the nature of those boards. I could certainly provide that feedback back to the staff that supports the other boards and commissions. Again, in the case of Planning Commission and Board of Adjustment, the meetings are more formal so food during the meeting wouldn't be appropriate. Yeah. Uh, could food be provided before the meetings? I'm sure it could. Um, maybe the best approach would be to provide that feedback back to staff, have them uh, take that feedback back to the boards and commissions and see if it's okay. Been, or even, or even the council member that's sitting on these board commission, if they, Certainly. if they hear concerns, just to, to address them. And, you know, because, they were, like I said, uh, it depends on the settings. Everything's different. So I'm... I'm just putting it out there. I'm not. Absolutely. We're certainly we not to opposed it. to uh, doing it, but again, it's been more of an evolution as, as opposed to a, a policy of sorts. Okay. And then the opening of, or is there going to be a date for the Bulkley Ranch pedestrian bridge? There will be. I don't believe there's a date yet. Okay. 
All right. And uh, I've been getting phone calls from people. Um, uh, they've been asking about the rec center and all that, and they, they're telling people that uh, our fees are going to go up. And I haven't heard anything like that, but um, that's what they've been people have been hearing from uh, staff at the rec center that the fees are going to go up. Well, as you probably recall, City Council has had quite a bit of discussion about the fees at uh, both Bison Ridge and Eagle Point. We can share that information back out to City Council again. I don't believe there's any changes in the works. Right. Uh, that would be something that would come later in the year for uh, 2019. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Councilwoman Elliott. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just a few things in respect of Lee, Councilman Douglas. Um, I just think something like this as far as um, you know looking at any type of free days especially with a brand new facility opening and we're not quite sure what to project as far as attendees um, I'm open for discussion I just feel like we all need to have that discussion so that we can provide our input um, and not necessarily put staff on the spot but at least if we can talk about it and, um, and you know in cultural council our meetings last for two hours and I know that a lot of people end up bringing their meals with them um, because it's a more casual environment and they're welcome to do that we've also had some of the members bring pizza I know Christy sits on that with me as well so um, I would like to maybe probably discuss options um, I don't necessarily see it as a, a true necessity, but yet it, I do understand a gesture of, of just uh, being a gracious host, maybe just offering a few light snacks. So I think that's something that would um, uh, warrant maybe just a, a slight discussion between all of us as a body. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Hughesman. Thank you, Mayor. I promise to be quick. Um, had the great pleasure this weekend of attending several community events. Started Friday afternoon with the Armed Forces Recognition Luncheon they had down in Aurora. Um, actually, it was in Denver, but I believe put on by Aurora. Um, Friday night went to the Sand Creek Regional Greenway Benefit. Uh, Saturday morning, the Senior Pancake Breakfast, and then Sunday evening, the uh, comedy show put on by Community Uplift Partnership. Just want to extend a thank you to Council for supporting all those events. I think it's great that we have members in the community that are trying to impact the community in as many ways as possible, um, from thanking our military to trying to provide resources for uh, students at Lester Arnold High School, and also making sure that we have good parks and trails for people to, to partake on. So thank you, everybody, for the opportunity to uh, participate in all those events, and for everybody out there that had a hand in putting those events on. Thank you for all your hard work. Thank you. Councilwoman Frank. I just wanted to take, take a moment to remind everybody to vote tomorrow. Um, the South Adams County Fire Board elections and the South Adams County Water and Sanitation District elections are happening tomorrow from 7 a.m. till 7 p.m. at either the South Adams County Water District or the South Adams County Fire Department Station 28. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, I'll move on to my report. Well, let's go with Brian's report. Thank you, Mayor Ford. We did uh, distribute via email the city manager update tonight. Uh, just two updates, uh, one regarding a commitment by staff to bring back the idea of uh, potentially hiring employees to do some work that we're currently contracting out. And then secondly, an update on the free landfill day at uh, uh, Republic Landfill that occurred back on April 28th. We also attached the legislative report and the city council work schedule. Thank you. Mr. Sheasley. Thank you, Mayor Ford. Uh, just briefly as a follow-up to the oil and gas discussion this evening, um, my office and staff are diligently working on these issues, but if, to the extent any of you have inquiries that come up in the course of what you hear, please feel free to reach out to me um, directly so um, we understand and recognize, and Mr. McGroom and I have talked a lot about transparency and, and public um, process being important um, to this influx uh, in the community. Um, to that end, I understand uh, the Colorado Oil and Gas Association has contacted um, folks. Um, I'm going to reach out unless there's an objection uh, from the council to see if they would be willing to present to the council and public as a whole. Um, so I just wanted to let you know that I was going to be planning to do that. Okay. That's it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Uh, I had a water commission meeting. I'm going to come back to that here in a second. 
Um, I also want to recognize uh, our staff, the police department, and the uh, joint venture with the Brighton uh, Police Department for our, our sexual assault task force. Uh, we kicked that off. Um, several of us council members were at the county building. Um, that's where they're going to be officed. And uh, congratulations to both Brighton and Commerce City for achieving something that I think will set a precedence on how business is done in the future. Had an area boards meeting, uh, meeting with Marcus Pockner, uh, joint meeting with Adams 14 school board members, uh, many of, uh, I think all of the council attended the uh, school district 14 joint board meeting. Um, we had a meeting with, or I had a meeting with uh, development prospect. Uh, there was the pancake breakfast I was unable to attend, but several members of the council were there. Um, and the Highway 2 opening was canceled due to weather. Um, I want to circle back about the meeting with a development prospect and the water commission meeting. Um, just to bring it to the, city, the, to the city council's attention, I've talked to Brian, and we're trying to figure out an issue that we're having along Tower Road. I want to make sure all the council is aware of it. Um, I met with a prospect that uh, is wanting to develop some very large buildings along Tower Road. Um, apparently, they don't have the water pressures necessary for fire suppression and would require external tanks to uh, be able to have fire suppression. Of course, I started to freak out because the last thing I want is every bit of our development along Tower Road um, to require some sort of external tanks for uh, and pumping systems for water suppression. Uh, apparently, there's something um, wrong with the pressure systems for South Adams. Uh, staff is reaching out to them. I'm telling you all this in case you hear something that you know the staff is working on it and trying to figure out what needs to be done to get the pressures up um, because we can't create the city we want to create by having not having the pressure necessary, especially after financing the water lines in Tower Road. Um, we should have a full service uh, city and I was really shocked, and the reason I've tied the two together is because at the Water Commission meeting, there was no mention, and I kind of got blindsided by the fact that there was a problem. Um, I want to make sure we get the problem figured out. I did talk to a water board member. They didn't know about it either, and apparently it's been going on for some months now. So uh, our staff is now informed on it and uh, reaching out and working with South Adams to try to resolve uh, the issue um, because without having the pressures necessary, the fire district has to require some alternate suppression system, and we shouldn't be having to require alternate suppression systems in a full-service community that we intend to develop. And so uh, that's a major part of the update on that. Um, Highway 2 was canceled due to weather, the old grand opening. Of course, Highway 2 is open and functioning properly. I have gotten a lot of uh, accolades for uh, how nice it is, um, but I have also been getting hammered on the fact that it's 45 miles an hour. Um, many people are hitting me with the fact that it's a highway. It was always 55. Why is it 45? Um, I, I understand that, but what I keep trying to make sure I let people know is that it's no longer a state highway. It is a municipal arterial, and we now have control of that road, not CDOT. We just did the widening. A lot of things have changed, and that uh, I know we can, we can always take a look at it to see what's happening. Unfortunately, the people that are complaining that it's 45 and not 55 are getting pulled over for going 65. And I have, uh, I have very little tolerance for somebody that's going 65 down a road that they think should be 55 and it's 45 because you're doing 20 over. So um, 
you know, I, I, I will listen to it for a while. If you're getting pulled over and you're going 47, 49, whatever, you might, I, that we might have concerns with. But um, if our officers are pulling people over that are going 20 over the speed limit, then they deserve a ticket. So um, for all of the folks at home watching, uh, please try to obey the speed limits on all Commerce City's roads, not just Highway 2. And uh, that particular person that was going 20 over said they will never use Highway 2 again. So the police uh, need to be looking for that person to be going 20 over on some of our other roads because I'm sure that that will be the case. Um, so drive safe and, and uh, benefit from the new road. I know it's carrying a lot more traffic now that it's open. And uh, every time I use it, it seems to be flowing pretty well. So thanks to the staff on getting that open. As far as I know, we're not going to have a grand opening because the, uh, of the one that got canceled. But uh, it is our opportunity to tell our staff thank you for a great project that turned out um, and, and exceeded my expectations. The only downside to the project was I keep looking for the in, in the pavement lighted markers that I was expecting to see yeah. at, at some of the intersections. And I see some that were put in uh, down on the south end. Um, when I first leave City Hall and I get on Highway 2, I'll see a few. Uh, I was just expecting to see more center line type lighted markers and not just some of the fog line lighted markers maybe they're there i haven't seen them it's too 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 much light but i've been <laughs> looking for them but uh, the street lighting the the guardrails um everything uh, meets my expectations and hopefully it does the council's expectations so kudos to the staff uh that all worked on the highway 2 project so now i'm done with my report if anybody has anything they'd like to add to it now's the time otherwise i will adjourn this meeting Mr. Douglas, of course you do. Well, okay, just uh, just an E470 update. Uh, and there was a letter just that was sent to uh, uh, Brian McBroom, city manager, on the hazmat route. That's um, uh, we're looking at E470 as a uh, an alternative to what's currently the hazmat route. Uh, right now, it's currently 100. It's I25. Um, so we're looking at different areas to E470. Um, also spoke with uh, Executive Director Tim Stewart with E470 on looking at some sort of program for wounded warriors um, who travel down uh, the C470, whether it's a discount or some sort of waiver. Um, we're in discussion about that. Um, I looked at my colleague here to the left. Um, he had brought that to my attention that it's happening in another state, so um, I need to get some more information from him. But... Uh, just as, just to support that, and if so, it could be a program where funds are set aside, and and uh, maybe those individuals could apply for a reimbursement on their tolls. Uh, but there is talk um, about a wounded warriors um, reduction or waiver. Thank Anyone you. else? And one more uh, that I think is important. Uh, to bring to the attention of the residents and to the council. Um, I've been given, and I would imagine the, the council's been given, a letter that was sent to me and a flyer about an upcoming event at Our Lady Mother of the Church um, from 1030 till noon this Saturday, May 12th. It is a, uh, uh, a group that is frustrated with the education and the uh, leadership of school district 14 and they're wanting to take back the district and uh, they state the reasons why I noticed they were out um, on, on uh, Quebec Street tonight uh, a lot of the teachers um, but there's a lot of pent-up um, frustrations and concerns so if anybody has any interests in um, going and talking about uh, trying to make School District 14 better um, through some efforts by a collective group of primarily teachers and parents. 
uh, May 12th, 10.30 to noon at Our Lady Mother of the Church. It's Mother's Day. Yeah. Sunday. That's right. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers in Commerce City. And happy Mother's Day to you, Steve. <laughs> all well, right. Thanks, Sean. With that being said, <laughs> there be no further business to come before the city of Commerce City. We are adjourned. Have a good evening. <laughs>